I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Twin Falls City Council for Monday, August 15th. It is 5 o'clock. For those of you wishing to join us, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a quorum of the council here this evening. All seven members are in attendance. Mr. Rothweiler, do we have any amendments to our agenda? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we have one request for uh, an addition. It is a special event application for the so Savior Southern Idaho event, which is scheduled to occur this Friday. We sent that out um, earlier today. It should be something that was included for you to review, and we'd ask that be considered to the consent calendar. And then the second item is just a clarification. Item number four in your consent calendar um, talks about the um, Wings and Things fundraiser. The times that were listed um, in the application were not um, accurate, and we want to make sure that uh, the right time is there. In the application, it talks about the event is going to occur from 12 noon to 3 o'clock. Uh, the correct time is actually from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., and so we just wanted to note that for the record uh, in the application. Uh, Mr. Dennis Boyer, a familiar name for all of us, is also here, and you might be able to answer questions regarding that event. All right. Thank you, Travis. So I would entertain a motion to amend the consent calendar, but not to approve the consent calendar at this time, since it's later on the agenda. I would Craig Lanting. Thank you, Mayor. I would move that we amend the consent calendar as noted by our city maker. Second. So a motion by Greg Lanting, seconded by Don Hall, to amend the consent calendar with the addition of the special event application for Saver Southern Idaho and uh, for the time change on wings and things. Is there any discussion? So I am going to abstain from this vote since the Saver Southern Idaho event is co-sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, my employer. Sharon, roll call vote, please. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Motion passes 6 to 0 with one abstention. Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, proclamations, which we have none this evening. So next on the agenda is general public input. Uh, could someone from staff bring the sign-up sheet up to me, please, for folks who signed up? Again, this is an opportunity for individuals from the public to provide public input regarding matters relevant to the City of Twin Falls. And I would ask that you please wait to be uh, recognized by the mayor. You approach the podium, uh, state your name and address, and whether you are a resident or property owner in the City of Twin Falls, and then proceed with your input. We are going to limit the input to three minutes per person this evening. Vice Mayor Hawkins will have the timer, and she'll show you your uh, time limits, and when you're Time has expired. Please be courteous to the other speakers and wrap up. So first we have Greg Lansing. Yes, I, Mayor, thank you, and make sure we're timing. I don't want to take any more time than anyone else. Uh, my military service always taught me that when you're wrong, say you're wrong, okay? And I was wrong. I, I made an assumption about because everything was being talked about was the grandmother, and that was a wrong assumption, and then I made a comment to a post, which is a little different than what was being said, but a comment to a, a post of someone else listing several items I thought were incorrect about an, an Internet article, and I was wrong. And I apologized to the family. I went on to try to make amends, and if somebody will tell me I could no longer find the Liberty and Justice Fund Me Go Fund Me account so somebody can tell me how I can make an additional beyond the one I've already made a donation to the family to help make amends, but again, I was wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lanting. Uh, next, uh, let's see. Paul Smith, you're signed up, but you probably wanted to speak about a different item. Okay. Uh, Pamela Day. Okay. Max Newland. Let's see, you have number four written down here. So is that what the one you want to talk about, the arts? Absolutely right. Okay, I apologize. 
Uh, Bethany Rasmussen. Welcome. Hi, I'm Bethany Rasmussen, and I am a resident of Twin Falls. So I was actually going to ask you, Mr. Talkington, I know that this is not an open... I'm Mr. Lanting. Mr. Lanting, I mean, um, what you're going to do from this point forward, um, because I know that it was expressed to us before that the city council was supposed to be unbiased, that they were supposed to represent everyone in this community, and so I was curious from this time forward um, what is going to be done as a city council to make sure that this family is represented fairly and um, to make sure that this doesn't happen again because um, I, I would hate to see my representatives of my city um, slip into this. I know that a lot of people are divided on the issue and um, it's a very slippery, slippery issue. I'm willing um, to answer. And I know that this is not a question and answer time, so, you know. I'm willing to answer, though. Okay. Yeah. And another thing, too, was I noticed when I was reading the comment, because it was removed, but I got a copy of it, that you mentioned something in the very first part of your article, and I can give you a copy of it if you're not familiar. I won't mention what specifically it was because I know that this is a sealed case and that um, that information should not be public knowledge. Um, but I'm curious how you got a hold of that information. Actually, I was saying, how did they get a hold of it? Was it mentioned in the article? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, I was pointing out inaccuracies I felt were in the article. Uh, where I felt I was wrong was on the first one. Okay. And how, what I will do differently, I will do it, what I'll ask them to do. I will fact check. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rasmussen. Next, we have uh, Glenetta Sweeterbelt. Welcome. It's Anita Ziderveld. Okay. Guys. My apologies. Okay. And I'm from Jerome. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for stepping forward. That goes a long way with me by you doing that first, Mr. Lanting, because I actually had this whole thing that I was going to share with you just because I am an advocate for the family, not for political reasons, not for personal reasons, but because I care. And when I read those facts, I just wanted, you know, one of the facts will say this father is present. He has been present even before the victim was born. He was the father that I really inspire you all to be. He is a caring father. And then the second of all, I was going to talk about, because you mentioned the video. He did see the video. Fact two is... Fact two, he has seen the first little part of the video and is haunted by it daily. He would have probably watched the whole thing, but as a loving father, who again has always been there, wanted to harm all those who harmed his baby girl. Yet he showed integrity and allowed the police to do their job. He trusted them to do the right thing by his daughter. And, you know, I just want to speak out for their character because that's out there now. What you posted is kind of hard to unpost. And that is harming his character as a father. And I don't think you'd want your, your character harmed as a father. And so I would like a public apology. Lee Stranahan from Breibart's here. He can take it nationally for you. He can take your apology to this father and their family nationally for you if you want to speak to him. And then well, that will just go a long ways. Oh, and that was... Because um, because I think um, if you don't do this, um, I'm just going to read what I wrote. Of course, I was upset when I wrote it. I'm a little bit not as upset anymore. But in adi addition to this post, I wanted to add that I demand Mr. Lanting make a public, a very public apology to this father and his family. And I'm going to make it a step further and request you do it using Lee Stranahan with Breibart News. If you truly are sorry, this is the way to do it nationally and redeem yourself and your words. <coughs> if you do not, we will all witness that you do not represent the people who, are, who, you elect, who elected you. But yourself and your own, 
If you do not, we will all witness that you do not represent the people who elected you, but yourself and your own ambitions. And let me remind you again that is very unconstitutional. You speak for us, the American citizens. So we, the people of the Constitution, demand a public apology to this family. And so I'm going to ask you, will you apologize publicly? I, I thought I just did. You did, but that was in my, I'm just reading uh, okay, my. Okay, all right. So. And, I, and I'll do it again. I was wrong. And I apologize to the family, and if I can, there's ways I can make amends to them, I will. Okay. okay. Well, Lee's right here, and he can take it nationally. Well, I apology. Think he can take Thank what you. I've just said. It's okay. part of the transcript. It's being broadcast nationally, or nationally because it's on the Internet. Thank so. you very much. And I just, you know, we do need to be careful because we do represent all agree. of the people. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Heather Stroop. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Heather Stroop, and I do live in uh, Twin Falls County. I do have a business in Twin um, and Mr. Lanting, I'd like to say appreciate your apology. Um, I know it's very humbling to um, have to apologize publicly, and I and I do appreciate that. It shows humility, and and I'm glad you you know you you did you know come forward and do that. Um, several weeks ago, uh, when I was here in one of the city council meetings, um, Mr. Berger, you read a statement to um, the city and to us publicly in which you stated that you were, um, that you stood with the victim and the victim's family. And um, in light of that statement, um, because uh, of Mr. Lanting's public um, Facebook post, um, I'm asking if, uh, you know, what your feelings are about that now and what you plan to do as a mayor. Um, uh, do you, you know, do you have any comments that you'd like to make publicly um, over that posting, uh, I, I do not. That was Greg's posting, and he's having the conversation with you about his posting. I have no authority to manage what the other council members say. True. As I as I said at that time, I think we all, as a community, need to let law enforcement and the prosecutor's office follow the letter of the law and manage through this case, which they have been doing. True. And, I and, agree. And that's where I stand today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Terry Edwards. I just want it to be known that... Uh, Mr. Edwards, can you please oh, state okay. your name and your address for the record? Terry Edwards, property owner, Twin Falls. Thank you. Um, this posting that we keep referring to, I just want to make sure everybody knows what page we're on here. And I have a copy of it right here before me. It says, um, one, there is no way the evidence came to light a few days ago. The case is sealed. You realize these internet fake news agencies can lie all they want and can never be proven wrong. The case is, a se is sealed and we'll never know any more than we know now. Um, another obvious lie is the child does not live with the father. The police and have now, the courts have the video, had a video since the night of the assault. The father is, as far as I know, is not even involved with the child. No way he saw the video. No doubt even he even talked to him. Let justice be served and let this child have a chance at a normal life without making up lies about what happened to her. The police and the courts are doing everything according to state law. And in this thing, I left out a big item at the first, in the first part of that because it's, there's some legal issues involved with that. And um, the other thing is, is that there's a lot of capital letters in this posting, which is kind of like yelling. Um, and I have a copy for each one of you so that you can read it, and also the council, uh, city council. Here's a copy for you, for your city council, eh? Oh, who is? It's our, it's our legal oh, council, well, yes. You are. <laughs> <laughs> That's one for you, and I have one for you, and I'd like to pass that out. I'll be back at the mic here shortly. Thank you. 
so you can post that on your wall. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Edwards, if you're going to address the council, you can do that from the microphone, please. Okay, uh, there's an item coming up here about a $25,000 horse that's proposed, and there's also some ancillary uh, $22,000 fees involved. I would suggest that you forego that because I wanted to ask City County Council. Sorry, here's our legal council. Sir. Legal council, City Council. I wanted to ask him if there's some uh, exposure the city has to this issue since it might be a civil case, this posting. I know you won't answer me, but maybe he could answer me. I appreciate the input and the question. Yeah, right. Lee Stranahan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lee Stranahan. I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm a uh, lead investigative journalist with Breitbart News. Um, I just want to be clear. Uh, I think, first off, I, I do appreciate Mr. Lanting not uh, extending the agony of the situation by being deceptive about it and just coming out uh, and, and not only admitting that he'd done what we reported he'd done, uh, with some degree of vetting, by the way, because we're not an Internet fake news agency. In fact, we're one of the top news agencies in the country. And I would say we do a much better job of reporting on this story than your local news agencies have, Times News and KMVT. Uh, we vetted that story extensively, so I appreciate you not uh, admitting it. Uh, and I also appreciate, like you say, you, you, you apologizing. And I think that the reaction of the people here shows the genuine decency of the people of uh, Twin Falls. Uh, which is what I've experienced since, I, since I've been here. Uh, but let's be clear about what happened here. You're a city official, sir. And you, if a constituent had written you a written letter and you had responded, and then once you were caught saying what you'd said, which was untrue, blatantly untrue, you made statements that were just read that were not true, sir. If you had destroyed that letter, I believe you'd be in violation. I'm not a lawyer, thank God. I'm not a lawyer, but I believe you'd be in violation of Idaho's Public Records Act because you were responding to a constituent in your official capacity. You were asked that question in your capacity as a city councilman, and you made statements that you've now admitted were not true. Then, once you were confronted by the mother, your immediate response was to destroy the evidence, correct? You pulled down... Do you, you no, pulled I, down, did, I did not. Does I, that I, Facebook I, post still exist, though? My... my it, I was, mine was a comment on an existing post, and until I read your article saying that it had been taken down, I didn't know it was taken down. The original poster of the first, you know, the, somebody posted, and I can't remember who it was, to be honest. I understood. Somebody posted your article yes. on Facebook, okay? I read that there. There was somebody down in there. My name got mentioned. That's how it ended up on my Facebook page. I did not take it down. Well, the okay. original person who posted the article or posted it first must have taken it down because I will guarantee you I did not take it down. I appreciate I appreciate you making that clarification, but I do I do want to point out clearly this was not you speaking. You are again this was you discussing this in your official capacity as a city councilman. And furthermore, I'm very interested. The first statement that. Uh, Terry didn't read. You made a very definite statement about evidence in this case. You made a definitive statement, and you know what that statement is, sir. Mm -hmm. You made a definitive statement that you were in absolutely no position to know since it's a sealed case. You didn't hear about it from the parents, right? I assume you didn't hear about it from the parents. And I assume you didn't hear about it from Grant Loeb's prosecuting attorney, because that would be a violation on Mr. Loeb's part. And he's, I've spoken to Mr. Loeb's, he's a professional. So when you, when you, in your official capacity, make a definitive statement about something that's going to be a, a, a point of contention at the trial, and I don't, again, I don't want to get into it, but you made a definitive statement. You didn't say, I've heard this. You said, there was no, and then you, you went into detail. I think that is a serious breach of your duty as a public official. 
Mr. And I, and I think it needs to be taken seriously. And I appreciate the input, and your time is up. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Julie Ruff. Julie Ruff, Twin Falls County. Welcome. A number of you have stated publicly or to me personally that uh, what we're dealing with in the city, this is a little off topic, you'll be glad to know, is um, not something that you can touch because it's a federal issue. A lot of you have made mention of that, that we are mis up, up, mispointing our discussions with you because you can't affect what's going on here. I'd like to point out, though, that you actually do, specifically you, Sean, you do. In 2011, you helped bring in a certain foreign company, a certain it's foreign it's company. It's actually not a foreign company. It's a U.S. company. With a globalist who intended to bring in uh, foreigners, and he is doing so. So I'm bringing that up. Uh, Sean, you said in 2011 that that company shared the kind of values we have here in Twin Falls. And you said it felt like the right fit, that they're very community-minded. You said that they had a philosophy to promote local farmers and preserve our heritage and strengthen every aspect of our economy and quality of life for decades to come. Those are your words. That's not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing the poor people in our community suffering more, as well as the refugees in our community continuing to suffer. That's a concern for me on both parts. I'd like to also state, I, I believe you're a Democrat, if I'm not mistaken, even though this is supposed to be a nonpartisan I'm, seat. I'm actually registered as an unaffiliated voter. Okay, okay. Well, what we have here is a lot of people who aren't quite citizens yet getting driver's licenses, and they're also bill payers. And we have an election coming up. And in Idaho, if you have a license and you pay your bill, you can vote. You're supposed to be a citizen, but I've never had to show my citizenship to register to vote. This is a concern to me because of the high traffic of non-Americans getting IDs and licenses. I'd like to point that out. I'd like to caution that the decisions being made on this council actually do have a direct effect, even though you say it's a federal issue, it's a federal issue, it's a federal issue. If you bring it into Twin Falls, it becomes a city issue. And that's why I'm bringing it up, because you've made it a city issue by bringing it into the city. You've made it an issue to the Republicans and the Democrats, and obviously there's a lot of warning out there right now of voter fraud. I, I don't know if you're following that media-wise, but yes, there's a lot of very reputable sources warning about that. I'd like to give you the heads up, guys. If you bring it into this town, it stops being a federal issue, and it becomes a city issue. Thank you, Mrs. Ruff. Your time is up. So that is all of the people who are signed up uh, on the list to address the council on the general public input, unless there is anyone else who wishes to. You're please welcome to come forward. Sorry, I'll get right to you, ma'am. Hi, Nolan Stroop from Twin Falls County. Hey, your three-minute rule for um, talking to the council, that's ridiculous. Right, what if what I want to say to you takes me more than three minutes? And it typically it doesn't because I'm not very long-winded when it comes to people who don't listen anyway. But a lot of the people who are trying to address you, I mean, they, they've gone over their time. They've got valuable things to say. What, so what happens if three minutes wasn't enough to say it? You guys don't hear it, which I guess doesn't matter because you don't care anyway. And our, our local media doesn't do a very good job of reporting on issues that we care about anyway. But you're listening to people who are Twin Falls residents or from surrounding areas who care enough to come and talk to you, and all you guys can do is say, well, we want to go home earlier. Don't act like it's, you know, uh, courtesy for the other speakers, because it's not. I mean, we all know it's not. Thank you so much for your input this evening. Ma'am, would you like to come forward? My name's Tammy 
Billman, and I'm in Twin Falls, and you can see I wasn't planning on coming. I was watching on TV, and enough was enough. Mr. Lanting, I'm here to kind of defend you. I don't know what you wrote or what you did or what you didn't do, but whatever it was, human. Um, to be threatened by Brait Bart, Bart Brait, but what, whatever the newspaper thing is, I don't know. I've read enough of it, don't know who it is, don't know, don't care. It's probably the one that declared you dead two weeks ago. No, I don't not. think so, but I think that was called clickbait. But. <clears throat> don't know, but enough is enough. If everybody's got a problem, and I feel sorry for this little girl, I'm terribly sorry about what has happened with this little girl, but we need to take it to the state level, okay? We need to take it where the change can be made, okay? And I'm not insensitive. Six years ago, my ex-son-in-law molested seven little girls and raped four. I didn't see any of this then, never heard it, okay? So don't tell me I'm insensitive to it. We need to take it where the change can be made. These guys can make the changes here within our city. You want to make changes, go to the state level. That's it. That's where the change needs to be made. These guys can only do so much. I'm sorry, but we've got to go on. We've got to move on. We've got to go to the next step. If we're going to help this little girl, we've got to go to the next step. And we're not helping. We're hindering at this point. We've got to move on. We've got to really help her and quit trying to get our name in the paper and on the computer. We've got to help her and stop causing so much aggravation for everybody and threats and all this stuff that's going on. We've got to, if you're going to help her, then help her and help the family and stop doing all this crazy crap. It's time to move on and go to Boise, do something where you can really do it. This isn't it. We've got to do something and go. Go where it's going to make the difference. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. So, uh, hold on. Let's, so again, this is, excuse me, Mr. Stranahan and Mrs. Billman. This is a city council meeting to address city business and to conduct city business. And if you want to go have a conversation about what you agree or disagree on, you can do that outside, please. Thank you. Next. Mr. Mayor and city council, my name is Paul Thompson. I'm, I'm a resident of Twin Falls. And my, my desire to speak before you today is really to, to address a, an open letter that I've written to the good people in the, the Twin Falls Police Department. And I'd just like to read it to them. Thank you. Um, in your presence and uh, my appreciation and respect for the hard day that we're in as a city. But uh, I think I'm convinced at the end of hard days, we become better people. And so, so my letter is to the, to the Twin Falls Police Department. Uh, I do not know many of you by name, but I see you all throughout my hometown. And I want you to know that I appreciate you. It's hard to not get tangled up in the weeds of all the national buzz about our good city and the unfortunate way that some have spoken to you and about you. So I'm always thankful to be in, the, in a city council meeting when you're being introduced you're being awarded a promotion, or you're being recognized for your duty to all the citizens in the city. Or I don't speak to any, uh, for I don't speak for anyone but myself. I want you to know 
that we are thankful to God for you. My gratitude is for the department that you represent and the duty that you serve. It, it must require of you something <coughs> that few are willing to take on. I want to thank you for the display of bravery that makes my general journey through life a safe and a pleasant place to live. You choose to take on dangerous issues, confusing situations, complex relationships, and you make way into some of the most sinful conditions that anyone could imagine. As a pastor, I've worked with many in our community that have had encounters with you. And I want to say thank you for being so compassionate, kind, and tender, especially to women and children and victims of abuse. Thank you for choosing to answer the dispatch call to walk into, middle, into the middle of complex and messy situations and still be there to try to do the right thing. So many of you operate under extreme pressure with professionalism, restraint, and you show respect to those who do not always return the favor is a credit to the, to the department as a whole, and that you do this not knowing that your life may be in danger is yet more than a credit. It is a mercy that you give to every citizen. I want you to know that I pray for you, and I pray for your families. I pray for your safety, and for your wisdom, and for courage. And I want to thank you for the care that you give to our community without prejudice, with respect, Paul Thompson, pastor of Eastside Baptist Church, Twin Falls. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the City Council during our public input session? Seeing no one, we will move on with our agenda. So the first item is the consent calendar, and before we accept a motion on that, I would ask that the item that was added, item number six, be separated from the consent calendar so that we can vote on items one through five before I recuse myself from item six. So if everyone's good with that, I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent calendar, items one through five. Don Hall. I would move that we approve the consent calendar one through five, excluding the addition at this time. Second. Motion by Don Hall, seconded by Ruth Pierce, to approve the consent calendar items one through five. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berger? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Motion passes seven to zero. and. Suzanne, if you could handle the other item on there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Council's wishes on the sixth item that we added to the consent calendar tonight. So Greg, hit the light there. Thank you, Greg. Oh, Greg we'll to pass along light. <laughs> <laughs> Move approval of item number six uh, that was uh, added this evening to the consent calendar. I'll second. We have a motion on the floor by Greg Lantine, seconded by Nikki Boyd, to approve the special event um, for this coming weekend at City Park, I believe. Is no. there any other discussion? It's at uh, Visitor Center, isn't it? Yeah. Visitor Center, I apologize, at the Visitor Center. Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Motion is approved 6 to 0 with one abstention. Thank you. Other items for consideration. The first is a request to recognize Lieutenant Terry Thusen for his completion of Northwestern School of Police Staff and Command and for being chosen as the recipient of the Franklin M. Kreml Leadership Award. And we have our Chief of Police, Craig Kingsbury. Welcome, Chief. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, prior to starting on this, I'd just like to thank the pastor for that very nice letter. Um, and he mentioned that he likes to see us recognize some of our employees for the great work that they do. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, we're going to recognize Lieutenant Thewison, who was a longtime member of the Twin Falls Police Department, and in fact, a uh, second generation member of the Twin Falls Police Department. Like many of you know that his father, Don, served many years here at the, at the Police Department. 
Um, uh, Lieutenant Thewison, if you could come forward, please. Lieutenant Thewison was born in Jerome, grew up here in Twin Falls, graduating from Twin Falls High School in 1991. He met his best friend and his sweetheart, Anna, in 1994 while they were living in Stockton, California. They were married in June of 1995. Terry and Anna have four children, Michaela, Andrea, Tiana, and Stephen. Terry will complete his 20 years in, in his law enforcement career this October, having spent just under two years with the Rexburg PD and approximately 18 years here at Twin Falls PD. Terry has served as a patrol officer, a school resource officer, a bike team member, a SWAT operator, a field training officer, a drug recognition expert, narcotics supervisor, he served in the criminal investigations division as a supervisor, and a patrol watch commander. In 2003, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant, and in 2005, he was promoted to the rank of staff sergeant. In 2014, then staff sergeant Thewison became lieutenant Thewison. He's currently assigned to the administrative services division. Uh, in this division, Terry will soon be taking, uh, helping us to, to form what we will be calling the Office of Professional Standards, which is a, a new section within the Twin Falls Police Department. Terry currently holds both his advanced and supervisory uh, certificates from Peace Officer Standards and Training. He completed a bachelor's degree from Boise State University in Criminal Justice Administration in 2006 and a master's degree in business administration from George Fox University in 2009. Terry also works as an adjunct professor uh, for Boise State University. And I know he also does some teaching here locally at, C or at CSI. Uh, Terry has, for his entire 20-year law enforcement career, represented this profession with the utmost integrity and professionalism. Terry was chosen to attend Northwestern University School of Police staff and command this summer. Now for many years this 10-week college level course put on by Northwestern University out of, out of um, the Chicago area, Chicago, Illinois area, um, has been held in Meridian here in Idaho at Idaho's post training facility. However for the last several years for many reasons uh, they haven't brought it here to Idaho. So it's been difficult to find a location where we could send somebody, both budgetarily and, and the fact that they're, it's a big commitment, basically going to be out of town for over 10 weeks. So when we recognize Lieutenant Thewison tonight, I also want to publicly thank his wife, Anna, uh, for the work that she did uh, keeping the family together while he was gone. Now, Terry went to Dickinson, Okay, was it North or South Dakota? North. It's, they're kind of all the same sometimes, North Dakota, <laughs> and uh, where he spent uh, his time. Now, I just, just today received a letter even the, uh, from David uh, Bradford, one of the directors. Dear Chief Kingsbury, as director of the Northwestern University Center for Public Safety, I am pleased to write you about the performance of Lieutenant Terrence A. Thewison during his attendance in our School of Police Staff and Command. At the end of each 10-week program, the Center for Public Safety presents the Franklin M. Kreml Leadership Award to the student who best displays the dedication, devotion, ethics, sense of justice, and other attributes that exemplify the kind of leadership that is needed in today's law enforcement community. Throughout this class, Lieutenant Terrence A. Thewison consistently demonstrated an excellence in these qualities and characteristically distinguished himself in these areas and therefore was selected by his classmates to be the recipient of the Kreml Award for the 398th SPSC class. Please convey my personal congratulations to Lieutenant Thewison for this outstanding achievement. So it is with that that I just wanted to show the council and the public the very nice plaque that Terry returned home with. And I'm wondering, Mitch, can we put it up just to, um, while he's setting that up, kind of a, can you get it, I think? Kind of a cool story. So, as I said, he was a long ways from home, and uh, we had planned to send uh, Captain Barnhart out there to the graduation ceremony to represent our administrative staff. And a, a night before the graduation, 
Terry and his classmates for transportation in Dickinson were using, as I understand it, a bus that was an old roller derby team bus. Maybe <laughs> fitting, I don't know. And they were, Terry was told by his classmates that they had to go to the airport to pick up the colonel from one of the state polices, police agencies that was going to come in and be a speaker at graduation. And so Terry was on the bus, and they were going to go pick this gentleman up, and then they were all going to go out to dinner the night before graduation. Well, to hear Terry tell the story, he's sitting in the bus waiting as this colonel is supposed to come out, and somebody from his class has gone into the airport to pick up said colonel. And when Terry sees this lady walking with his classmate, his first thought is, well, I didn't figure that the colonel's name sounded like a lady's name. And that colonel sure looks an awful lot like my wife. <laughs> well, to show what an impact Terry had made on his classmates and knowing that they had voted him, and I don't believe Terry knew at this point in time to be the Kremlin Award winner for his leadership, they got together and as a class paid for Anna to fly out there and be there to watch Terry receive this award and to graduate from this program. So, Mayor, members of the City Council, our great public here, residents of Twin Falls and our great Magic Valley area. I just want you to know that that's the kind of men and women that you have representing you. Men just like Lieutenant Thewison. You know, when you hear me swear people and you hear me talk about what our uniforms mean and our nameplate and our badge and our patch and Terry has consistently for the 18 years he's been a member of the TFPD represented those things in such a great way. Uh, and I can tell you that in my little time of being here, I know that he's learned this from his father and from his mother and the support that he's had uh, from his wife and family. He has never, ever done anything to disgrace his badge, his patch, or his name. So I present you uh, with Lieutenant Thewison, the Kremel Award winner. Congratulations, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just real quick, I just wanted to uh, tell the council, as well as city management, thank you for the opportunity to attend Northwestern. I remember on my way out to uh, nowhere, as I thought I was heading, the 12-hour uh, trip out there, I started to wonder, what did you get yourself into? Ten weeks in North Dakota. And I stopped at the uh, state line, and I sent the chief a, a selfie of me with the state line of North Dakota in the background, and I told him, Chief, I made it to nowhere okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the 10 weeks that I spent uh, in Dickinson, with the other commanding officers, it's not nowhere to me. anymore, but I also realized how special Twin Falls is, what an incredible community we have. One of the things that I gained most out of Northwestern was the realization that we do have a very blessed community, that our police department does enjoy a sense of support that is not felt in many places throughout our country. And I also realize that we have some of the best men and women working in our city for our community, and I would put them up with anyone in this country because of the dedication and sincerity that they serve with. So with that, I just wanted to again say thank you for the opportunity to go. Lieutenant, before you skedaddle off, we have a few uh, council people who would like to say a few words here. I think so, Don Hall. So, Terry, I think it was about 17 years ago that I loaded you up in a car, and we I was a sergeant at the time, you were a patrol officer, and we went to ISU for some kind of cultural diversity class or something. 
And I, I remember like it was yesterday that you stood up in this class full of sergeants and lieutenants and corporals and other community members and you did not shy away from your opinion. Um, and and I, I took away from that that you were going to be a strong leader in our department. And this really shows it. And I was wondering when you were going to break down and sh show a little bit of a tear tonight. Because <laughs> this was absolutely a, a moving uh, testament to you and your family. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Chris Talkington. Well, actually, I've known uh, Terry uh, since we were all neighbors on Galena, he and Don. Uh, Terry always had a special focus. He was, uh, I won't say the enforcer of the kids on the neighborhood, but he made sure everybody was kind of following the rules. Nobody got bullied. Nobody got hurt. And I wasn't sure where he was going to end up at this uh, time some 20 years later. But uh, it, we depend so heavily upon not only the character and the uh, expertise, but the, the, the future of our police department of people like you, Lieutenant. And I tell you that uh, having lived in North Dakota, I've been through Dickinson many times, and I can assure you that the roller derby bus is high culture there, okay? <laughs> Congratulations. Really proud of you. Thank you. Chris, Greg Lanting. Well, Lieutenant, uh, thank you for your efforts for our police department. I met you in the field on numerous occasions uh, handling situations, and I've always remarked on your professionalism. And I, when I saw you, when you right after you got back and we were down at the, I'm going to call Blue Light Special, whatever we had down at the park that was honoring the police and of all the different police department things, I could see the pride you had in, in the, that you'd finished that, that subject or that class. And thank you. Thank you. Well, once again, Lieutenant, congratulations. Thank you for your service. And uh, uh, you, this is well-deserved recognition for your leadership. And I uh, appreciate your continued commitment to our community. Thank you, Mark. Next on the agenda is presentation of service certificates to outgoing Historic Preservation Commission members Wendy Rice and Randall Watson. And we have Kelly Weeks. Hiding out in the back, Kelly. I'm Kelly Weeks. I'm Planner One, staff liaison for the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, Mayor Berenger, if you'd come down with the certificates. Yes. We'd like to present certificates of appreciation to uh, Wendy Rice and Randall Watson for their service on the Historic <coughs> Preservation Commission. Wendy served a uh, full term of three years. She started um, in 2013. Her term expired in July of 2016. She regularly attended the meetings and she served on all the subcommittees she was asked to do. Um, she didn't hesitate to volunteer for anything outside the time of the meetings. Randall served two full terms. He was on the commission for six years. He also attended regular, regularly, and he served on subcommittees and volunteered time, too. We appreciate your service. They did a fine job. I think it's appropriate that we have Nancy say a few words about them since she's our chairman of our commission and, and an active chairman at that. Nancy Taylor, chair of the Twin Falls Historic Preservation Commission. These two I have to tell you, let's start with Wendy. If anyone has been down Lincoln Street lately, Wendy almost single-handedly restored 
the old street lights along Lincoln Avenue, and they are absolutely breathtaking. She wrote the grants. She and Randall um, supervised the renovation. Just amazing and a wonderful part of Twin Falls history. They're absolutely beautiful. Randall is an engineer by trade. He helped us many times. In fact, he's still on our call list if we need specific information regarding, you know, can this be done, can this be done. But they truly served, and I'm truly proud of them, and, and I'm sorry to see them go. But there's more to come. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. And to both uh, Randall and Wendy, thank you for your service on the Historic Preservation Commission. You have been a very, very active group over the past several years, and the, the fruits of your labor are well seen in the community, and I appreciate your efforts to be a part of that group to preserve our heritage here. So next, out with the old and in with the new, right? So we have a request to confirm the appointments of Andrew Dunn and Samra Cullum to the Historic Preservation Commission. So uh, Wendy and Randall have completed their uh, terms of service, as we just heard. And city staff posted a vacancy notice for these two positions. Staff received applications from four individuals with an interest in serving on the Historic Preservation Commission. We had an interview panel that consisted of the uh, chair, Nancy Taylor, uh, Councilwoman Ruth Pierce, uh, Kelly Weeks from our planning department, and myself. And we interviewed two of the individuals. Uh, one of the individuals was out of town on a family emergency who uh, had submitted interest, and the other lived outside of the city limits. Uh, the interview panel felt that the two applicants uh, who we interviewed were very qualified, uh, very passionate about serving uh, on this committee. And the recommendation from the uh, from that uh, interview group is that Andrew Dunn and Sam McCullum be appointed to the commission. These would be for full three-year terms, and both appointees would then be eligible for a second three-year term as well. So that would be my recommendation to the council, and I would uh, entertain a motion to that effect. I would move that we accept the appointment of Andrew and Samra. Oh, my light's not on. Well, Jeez. That works. Um, please. So we have a motion by Ruth Pierce. Is second. there a second? Seconded by Don Hall. Uh, council discussion. Councilwoman Pierce, did you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay. Any further discussion from the council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Chris Talkington. Yes. Greg Lanting. Yes. Don Hall. Yes. Ruth Pierce. Yes. Suzanne Hawkins. Yes. Nikki Boyd. Yes. Sean Barriker. Yes. Motion passes seven to zero, and both Andrew and Samra are here this evening. I would invite you each up to just give us a very quick uh, couple of words about yourself and why you're interested in serving on this commission, what you're looking forward to. So I do have to tell a story about Andrew, though. When he came in for the interview, he asked how my son was doing, and I was like, okay, yeah, he's fine. So Andrew actually worked at the daycare for my youngest son, who is now 15, at the time when he was, I don't know, 18 months, maybe two years old. So we go a ways back, but it was it was impressive to. Uh, he's a big guy, so the kids grown don't up get a bit. it. He's grown up like I told Sean, there hell hath no fury like a toddler who got the wrong color cup. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Andrew, welcome. Please introduce yourself and say a few words. My name is Andy Dunn. And, and if you could pull the mic up, you actually need to yes, talk to us so that it records. Please. I live in. It's I live here in now. Twin. I'm the director of that preschool now. It was a family business, so. I have a stake in the community. I'm starting graduate school at Idaho State University this fall. I made sure to arrange my classes around so I could do this because I have the interest in history and I have the stake in the community. Yeah. So, thank you and welcome. Good to bring it down. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samra Cullum and I've lived in Twin Falls for about 20 years and I went to Idaho State to get my undergrad in history and I'm currently working my doctorate in higher ed administration for CSI here and I'm really excited to give back to this wonderful community that's given so many opportunities so I'm excited to do some good work. Thank you. Welcome Samra, thank you so much. Next on the agenda, we have a request to approve the concept and funds for a public art piece to be installed at the North Five Points Pocket Park. And uh, we have Carolyn White and Wendy Davis here to 
present that information. Carolyn White with the Arts Council and Wendy Davis, our Parks and Recreation Director. Welcome. Uh, welcome. I'm Carolyn White with the Magic Valley Arts Council. And uh, several months ago, we were tasked with uh, the request to come up with a piece of public art for the uh, North Five Points Pocket Park. I have to be careful how I say that. Uh, it's kind of a tongue twister. Um, that would represent the idea of how our valley became magic. In other words, the importance of bringing water to our community without the use of actual water. <coughs> so we sent out a call to artists and we received several pr proposals and the committee finally selected the one that we're going to present today um, with a lot of input from the various committee members. This has been quite a, an evolution um, we've started out in one direction and really have turned it around into the concept that we're going to propose uh, at this time. So as you'll see on the wall, we have the, uh, an overview of the park that we're talking about. It's at a very uh, heavily traffic intersection and um, it's not that large of a space to work with, so we did have some challenges. pink area indicates the actual footprint of the space we could use, uh, recognizing all of the setbacks and uh, everything that we have to um, work within. Okay, this is kind of represents just a, a rendering, an uh, artist's interpretation. Uh, from the artist that we selected, uh, the footprint that the artwork would um, fit into the park. And then this is the final concept. It utilizes the horse that some of you may have seen in the past for one of our art and soul competitions. The artist's name is uh, Greg Bartlett. He's a local artist. And then uh, in concert with the Twin Falls Canal Company and the County Historical Museum, um, the rest of the concept came together. This is a representation of an, it's an actual piece of uh, equipment. We've had numerous names for it, so I'm not even going to try to tell you what the actual name is because it's kind of been shifted around. But it was a piece of equipment that was used to help create the canals. And then there's also a head gate that the Twin Falls Canal Company is going to contribute to the project as well as some additional assistance. So I'm going to turn it over to Wendy now to kind of go into the rest of the concept. Um, let me just show you one last image. This is the actual horse. So if you recall seeing it around town, so, and we decided that it would be fun to tie it in to have an actual artist piece and then tie it in with the actual artifacts. Good evening. My contribution to this piece of it is primarily to talk about the landscaping. Well, maybe we'll just start with that. So the part of what's going to bring this whole piece of art to life is um, depicting the impact of the water on the Magic Valley and the transformation of the landscape as that happened. And we um, in the committee decided probably the best way to do that would be through landscaping um, to kind of show the impact of the water. And so right now we have a rendering of um, the horse and the piece of equipment and the head gate and then a depiction of the canal um, bordered by a cement border. And now let's do the overhead one too. Um, laid out in the park kind of like that. And so what I did is got some figures to give us a pretty good idea of what it would cost to do exactly that. And that would include putting weed barrier down under the rocks um, and under the other part, the plantings, um, removing the sod, 
changing the sprinkler system, installing uplighting on the art piece. Um, I think I think that was kind of the mo mostly. I can't remember my whole list of the things that I used um, to come to this number, but. And again, this is kind of a rough estimate based on a sense of how big this piece would be. Um, we don't have the exact measurements. I did talk to the canal company to get, and actually this is the one I drew on, sorry, <laughs> that has the dimensions of approximately what they thought their berm and their canal and how long the canal that they planned to make would be um, and a sense of maybe what it would cost to find some blue landscaping rock to make that water piece. And so that's... That's where we landed on this 22,000 rough estimate of what it would cost to do that. So I think at this point, if you guys have any questions, um, we have more information if there's more questions. Thank you, Wendy. Don Hall. I would just add, uh, Chris and Greg and I were on this committee uh, assigned by the mayor to uh, uh, be involved in, in the concept and walking through this. Actually, credit goes to Chris for bringing the subject up in the first place. He's the one that brought it up. Uh, some of the things that we were talking about in this area right here, you saw the artist's rendition of the sagebrush, not a very good rendition of sagebrush, but um, here, uh, and, and this is just, I, I would just state it is conceptual at this point. One of the goals I personally have about this artist rendition or this artist piece, artistic piece, is that we don't develop something that's going to be very difficult for our parks and rec um, employees to be able to mow around and uh, do do those kind of things, the maintenance of it. We want to keep it as uh, clean maintenance-wise as possible because our parks and rec have how many thousands of acres do they have to take care of? It might be more hundreds. Well, well, well with Agra Falls? Or hundreds of thousands, right? Okay. Uh, how many acres do we mow? Mow, I think manicured acres, it's 600 and 250, and then how many acres do we have all together with Augur Falls that we have to maintain? That's like a thousand. Well, that's what I was saying about a thousand. So they have a job in front of them, and every time that we do something like this, we create more work, which obviously in the, in the long run can cost more money, taxpayer dollars. So when we start talking about this area and the concept, concept of uh, the type of uh, plants that we would put there, um, I, I, my goal has always been make it as, as natural as it would have been in the 1904 era um, and maintenance free as possible and, and, and frankly the more grass we reduce in some of our park areas especially something like this we do live in a desert and I think that we always have to be conscious of that and our water usage that's one of the that's one of the reasons that when we ta started talking about this uh, the first concept was that we were thinking about putting water an actual water feature but we didn't think that that was a wise use of resources and the water and besides I'm an old cop so I could just see kids putting suds in there and it would just foam up during the night because that's probably what I would have done when I was 15 so I always think about maintenance I think about um, um, uh, uh, the visual aspect and and I will tell you I'm very very excited about this project and doing it right gone are the days in my opinion that we throw some grass seed out and a few railroad ties what we build today needs to have an eye on on maintenance and on beauty and and on the concept of how our community came together thank you Don Nikki Boyd well I think this is really a beautiful thank you a beautiful addition and everything that I'm reading about and looking at other cities who are growing and expanding uh, like we are all across our country one of the things that the citizens are really liking are things that bring beauty and 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 history and this is something that people have a lot of pride in and I the when I see the plantings there by the horse's beautiful feet immediately I switch to hard water deposits on a beautiful piece of art so however we water around that needs to definitely be dripper system so we get no no water on that it, sagebrush I guess can just grow and it, 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 it get its water out of so do we have dwarf sagebrushes 
so we don't cover up the art. And then my, my, my question that I was the most curious about is how competitive um, I know you worked really hard to get, you know, some thumbnail numbers, but how competitive can we be with the, um, the implementation of actually getting this done versus, you know, the, the rough number? You know, we had that meeting on Wednesday afternoon, and our, yeah, and so I didn't have a lot of time to get numbers, and I went to the Parks Department, and they didn't have time to help me either, so... We just threw some really rough numbers at it to give a pretty good estimate um, of what it would cost to have a contractor come in and do something like this. We reached out to several contractors, and I only had one respond and was able to give me some pretty quick numbers. But I would bet that this is high for that. If we expand the area and include more plantings and work, You know, we've, we've talked a little bit about maybe expanding the landscaping toward the corner and doing some things like that. You might give up some of the curbing, um, but you might gain more expensive plants and things. So how confident I am with that number being a solid number moving forward, I think it's more of a ballpark to give you an idea of where we're kind of at with landscaping. I have it broken down. I mean, I can show you the numbers and where they came from for each piece of of the estimate of twenty two thousand. Um, if that if that's interesting I can they're kind of penciled in on the front of the folder. <laughs> right. No, I no I understand. I was just I was just wondering I it, think we you know, and this is before we talk to see if anybody wants to donate plants, to see uh, you know and, and again I reached out to the canal company and Brian wasn't there. Um, I spoke with Clay who anticipates doing some of the work, but he didn't know if they had anticipated putting any landscaping cloth under the rock or anything like that. So I just had them figure all that in because I didn't know if we were going to have to buy it or if it was going to be there or not. So there's going right. to be places where we can probably cut it down a little. Oh, he is. Yes. Perfect. So do you, want to, do you want to address what you were thinking there? I'd like that. Yeah, Brian, if you could come yeah, forward, please. I, I can't. Brian Olmstead. I live south of Twin Falls. I manage Twin Falls Canal Company, and and I have worked with the group on this quite a bit. and And I'd agree with Wendy. I think the, that estimate's probably pretty high. I I don't know the electrical or the or the uh, geo membrane or whatever it is for the uh, weed resistance, but um, we plan on donating all the dirt, all the rock, and um, the shaping and the head gate and that kind of stuff. So so you're looking at the plantings and the the barriers and the weed control and the sprinkler system and the lighting, I think. And and, um, and then I don't know, uh, I haven't had a chance to price. We don't have green rock. That's something I can't provide, green or blue. Um, uh, I know there is, I've seen at the Haley Botanical Center, there's green rock that's been crushed. I think it's from Oakley area. So I, I think it's available. We could probably, you know, we're looking at um, maybe 15 yards of that or something. So it's something that... Um, we could probably haul that. Uh, my board feels this is an important project. It's a story that needs to be told. Um, so, you know, those are the only uh, the only questions I see is really is, uh, you know, curbing can be priced. I think electrical, what that uh, what that green, whether crushed rock or whether it'll be uh, more of a slate type rock, I, to kind of simulate water. That's going to be kind of the, but you know, uh, I can't imagine it being more than a, a thousand bucks worth of rock or something like that to tell you I have even seen they make a they make a rubberized uh, product that simulates landscape rock that you can get in blue or green so maybe hmm. I don't know if wind blows it though or, or something like that so probably stick with rock uh, any other questions any other questions for Brian while he's up there I think it's real doable and um, uh, I think it can be very maintenance free and um should last a long time. Uh, the museum does, uh, uh, I had a request from uh, Gary Kaufman, I, I asked him to come at the uh, museum board, but um, they would like some kind of signage that indicates that this, um, it's called a, an Austin wheeled scraper is what it's called, the implement. That, and they were used not only on canals, but on building roads and that kind of stuff. But it's a neat old piece and they're willing to um, have it on permanent loan, I guess you'd call it the museum. And, 
they want a little MOU that uh, uh, goes with it and some kind of signage that this was donated by the Historical Museum and come see us at this location. And maybe a little bit of other signage might be good if we do, um, if we can come up with some money for that. But that could be a, a later on project. Thank you, Brian. So, oh, Nancy, Nancy Taylor again, I'm sorry. I'd like to speak about the project on a more esoteric basis. I was on the committee along with Paul Smith, please, Paul. We had uh, lots of community members from the historical point of view, from the canal company, from the county museum, from interested citizens, and we, and like we said, it was a process to get here. This is a true testament to our valley and how it was built and how it grew. Um, a community without public art is not much of a community. It can be the art and soul, did I just steal something? <laughs> of a community and this will be fascinating for our citizens to enjoy at one of the busiest intersections in our city. Um, just a fabulous, fabulous piece and I really urge you to fund it. I think everyone will be happy and Don's concern about people in prom dresses crawling on the horse. <laughs> I'm not sure that will happen because the horse is kind of spiky. I'm not concerned about it. I just know yeah, it will happen. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it will. But what a fabulous project. And we had a group of community members that so worked on it and put their heart and soul. And um, I urge your vote. Thank you, Nancy. Chris Talkington. Well, it's not often that we combine history and art, but I think this uh, breaks the mold for Twin Falls. Uh, you can argue it from either side, and uh, it's been so eloquently stated by our, our different speakers, but uh, this is a story that is not understood by a majority of people who either were born here or migrated here from other areas. This was a difficult process of grubbing sagebrush, of building roads, digging canals. This testifies to that through the draft horse, through the, I called it Fresno, but everybody else calls it a different implement for digging the canals. Uh, I think it's going to stand the test of time. I told the group that we'll either be laughed out of town or it's going to be instantly recognized as a missing and needed component of our history of Twin Falls. A couple other points that haven't been brought up, uh, of course, we're not using real water. We want it to be a year-round exhibit. We're employing solar lighting, so it'll be a 24-hour. We are not. Been told we're not. We're going to use a coal-burning furnace. Is that what we're going to do to generate electricity? I'm not saying that we're not going to use the solar lighting, but when I asked um, the city electrician um, about it, he was not very favorable about trying to do solar lighting. He said it doesn't hold up very well and he hasn't had very good success with it. And so they're all suggesting that we wire, hardwire those lights in. Okay, scratch that then. But I think it will provide a teaching tool for the schools as well as the tourists and our <coughs> uh, local citizenry to come by. And we definitely, uh, Brian, I think you mentioned we definitely need a, uh, an historical board in reference to what it represents and the donations. Uh, that have come in, but there's no better place in Twin Falls, and I'm glad that uh, uh, the community has uh, gotten behind such a worthwhile project, and uh, appreciate uh, consideration for the vote tonight, which is funded, by the way. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. Because Lori Race is here and she knows everything. <laughs> Lori, can you explain to us again how this fund was set up for public art and how it works and what we can and cannot do with the money that is in that account? Thank you. You bet. Lori Race, CFO for the City of Twin Falls. So um, back in June of 2007, the City Council passed Resolution 1785. And what that says is that a small portion of our capital improvement fund will be set aside for just such a purpose. Um, I would say that at the end of this year, it looks like we'll have almost $55,000 in the account or in that fund. And um, we put aside about $6,000 a year into that fund. 
and it is earmarked or ready to be used for artwork. Yes, per the it's kind of like we can't take um, water money and spend on streets. That's and right. It's this very was specific. a specific resolution that was passed. Great, thank you. You bet. Please let me also recognize Carolyn, her invaluable experience of getting the the art <coughs> contractors to be. Couldn't have done it without you, Carolyn. Greg Lanton. Well, I'd like to also thank, I'd like to thank my other two council members. I was on the committee and I was very well involved early, but uh, sick parents kind of took me away quite a bit. I didn't really uh, finish very appropriately, so thank you guys for uh, carrying the ball on this. I appreciate that. I'd also like to thank the cooperation of the Arts Council, the, uh, the museum. Uh, thank uh, Brian and Roger, I, Roger, I assume, still the chairman of your board, and uh, Roger Blass and for their their support of this activity. I think that, that shows everybody coming together to cooperate for this. I think you made it, not only did it make it better, but it made it more feasible. And that's uh, uh, one of the important things uh, <coughs> that I like to say. And, and like everybody said, this was a process. We, we kind of, we there were some ideas brought forth by the artists, but we kind of had to mold that to where we needed to get to uh, and uh, that, that's the way I think lots of things work out. If you can get enough voices that are trying to build things rather than tear things down, moving things forward, uh, then you end up with a better project. And I think the project got better as we went along. And yeah. I, I'll give Paul some support on that too. Paul was a little skeptical with Guinea, but he put his efforts in, and uh, and we made this made this a better better. Uh, He's smart, and I will definitely be voting for it. Thank you, Boyd. Resolution 1785 came about in 09? 07. 07. 07. 07. And, and so now that there is a balance, I believe, $7,796, no? 55000 Okay, a after, year. so what I'm looking at is if, if we fund this project in its entirety, we have a balance of just under 8,000? Not that. Okay. And then this re resolution, it didn't have a sunset clause or anything. It's something that, as a community, everybody believed that we would want to, you know, build this up. And as we find opportunity for something really great, that, that it would, the monies would already be there. Was that so, the intent? So, so I can actually speak to the resolution. Uh, briefly as I helped to draft that when I was on the council and Fritz assisted me. So around this time there was quite a movement um, in communities around Idaho uh, what was referred to as the 1% art funding. So it was, the, the strategy was to take 1% of a capital project uh -huh. and commit that to public art components either of that project or to generate money. That didn't go far here. And so we ended up coming up with a formula that was palatable to the council at the time that dedicates those funds in there for a for public art projects. And to the best of my knowledge, none of those funds have ever been spent, or if they have, maybe, yeah, I don't think any of them since its inception. So the intent was to um, create some funding mechanism, uh, really, at least my vision at the time, was to partner with private funding to assist in Installing art around the community. Okay, thank you very much. I missed the arts council too, did Carol? Thank you for your efforts. Don Hall, are you ready for a motion? I, I am not actually. I'd like to. I have a couple of things to weigh in on. So this is going to sound really ironic coming from me, since I was the one who really kind of pushed this funding component a while ago. Um, I'm concerned that we don't have a public art strategy for the city of Twin Falls. We have some public art components in various places, but we have never sat down and driven a community vision for what public art should be. Is that historic statues? Is that colorful murals? Is that, you know, whistling machines like you see in downtown Boise? Is it all of those things? What is it? And I am hesitant to basically spend the entirety of our public art fund um, on a single piece that, while I think it's important, 
Um, I think it's in the wrong location. I think if it's designed to be a teaching tool, it's inaccessible. It's in the middle of a triangle, in the middle of a five-point intersection, basically. So to use it as a, a teaching mechanism for elementary school kids and to try to share with our visitors what it means, you drive by it. And if you get stuck at the light, you might be able to glance at it a little longer, but it's difficult to get to. Um, I think that pieces like this are important. I think we need to have a comprehensive view of using public art as strategies to accomplish goals that we already have. So placemaking, using public art as a way to get people to walk up and down a neighborhood, using public art as a way to get people to go access the trail and exercise, um, using it as a way to celebrate history and preserve our heritage. Um, but I think we have never had a very good community conversation about what that means. I appreciate all of the folks who were part of this and all of the effort. And again, I don't want it to sound like I'm speaking against this piece. I cannot support spending upwards of forty to fifty thousand dollars for a project in this location. I would rather see us take a step back and as we do our update to the strategic plan in the coming year, we talk about places in our again community developed, community driven strategic plan that public art makes sense as strategies and tactics to accomplish goals. Um, and have a larger vision for that so that we can go try to tap uh, grant dollars that help to support specific initiatives. But grant dollars of I want to put up something pretty are difficult to get. So I think if we took a pause and took a step back um, and kept this as an option but looked at a broader strategy, I would be much more comfortable than just spending a lot of money on a single piece. Well, the Urban Renewal Board met last week and approved the concept of uh, art on the renovated downtown area, including seven panels uh, on the west side of the uh, now non-existing Rogerson building. That is being done without an art commission or 10 years of studying what we need. Uh, I think this is a project that will potentially lead to some other type of uh, ideas of what we want to have in the way of historic art or uh, just pure art. But uh, originally the, uh, the 25000 for the art project was to come out of that dedicated fund. At one time we talked about monies <clears throat> either in the parks department, I see Wendy wincing, but not from the art project in particular. I think that, uh, that we could use some guidance from the city manager on that. It may not be necessary to use some or all of that 22000 But I have to totally disagree of being in the wrong location. And the fact that Urban Renewal has approved the concept of art in the downtown uh, newly renovated mall area uh, shows this is an idea whose time has come. Don Hall. Mayor, I would ask uh, the city manager weigh in on, on uh, Chris's thoughts. Yeah, so when we take a look at what funds would be eligible in the parks fund for this year for upcoming capital projects, we don't believe that there are any funds that would be available that aren't dedicated for a specific purpose. So when you look at funds that go to whether they're impact fee eligible, you know, those projects are out there, or whether it be associated with Turkey's Lake, um, those are restricted funds as well for parks projects. So w without my knowledge and, and just quickly conferring with, with Mitch, we believe that all of the project load um, has, has exhausted the resources that were committed for fiscal year 2016. Remember, fiscal year 2016 ends on September 30, and in uh, a few <coughs> minutes we're going to be talking about opportunities for fiscal year 2017, and we're also, as part of that conversation, going to engage in that additional $300,000 that, that may or may not be eligible, and that might be a, a source and a funding source to be able to help offset some of those costs, which can be bridged over, over a two-fiscal year period. Um, that 300000 really could also, we have some ideas at staff, but also if you wanted to backfill the public art um, piece with, 
with these funds, you could also do that as well. Hmm. Thank you, Travis. Don't help. I'd just add that uh, I know that we said thank you to a lot of folks here, uh, Twin Falls Museum, <coughs> Brian, and that canal company. You really stepped up. <laughs> the canal company did. Uh, uh, a couple other folks that I'd like to mention is Lamar Orton has uh, uh, stepped forward. I've had a couple conversations with him, and he's willing to be part of this, our own Lamar Orton. And if you know anything about Lamar and his passion about um, native plants and, and, and those kind of things, he's, he's on board with us. The other thing I wanted to mention as well is uh, there is a water fountain at that location. It's, I think it's the 20th Century Club, and it's kind of you know, decayed and older, and there we've been talking about trying to bring that back up uh, and and have it work again. And I don't think we've really investigated what it's going to take, but I think that's uh, that's a good idea. That can lead me to the next thing that I was going to say. I think it is the absolute right location for this. It is visible; you can see it. It it, it welcomes you to downtown. Um, as far as assess accessible, it's accessible. There is a street that you can park. I've walked over to that location on numerous occasions. Um, it's not, I mean, you're not going to find 50 uh, parking places, but you're going to have enough adequate parking for a few people to stop by, take a look. And again, it's a, it's a welcoming to come downtown. Uh, it shows our history in a, in probably if not the busiest intersection, one of the busiest intersections of our community. And, and I think it's absolutely lo the right location. The other thing I wanted to mention, I had a conversation with Representative Lance Clow, actually walking over here for our meeting. He called me and he said there is a tree there. We've discussed all the different trees and everything that we might have to trim up. There is a tree there that was dedicated to his father-in-law, and he said that he did not want that tree to get in the way of this, that it could be moved or dedicated another tree for his father-in-law. But I expressed to him that I didn't think that we were going to have to do that. So I, I, I share that with, with just saying, look at all the folks that have come together for this project. I believe it's the right location and it's the right time. And especially knowing, and I don't want to deplete the fund either, but knowing that we could maybe backfill uh, with our upcoming uh, budget because there are other projects that we would like to do in the future. We don't want to blow it all on one. Uh, I think that uh, this is the right time, the right thing to do. And with that, if I could make a motion. So we actually had a few members of the public that wanted to address us on this issue as well. I'll wait. Um, this evening. And also Nikki Boyd has a comment. Uh, I do think it is a very welcoming just that gateway to downtown. I, I, um, I'm a little concerned about the price. I know nice things cost money, uh, but it just seemed like the the extra twenty two thousand. Certainly, we could do it for half that or something. I don't know, and I don't know what kind of partnerships we could form that would help us get it done. I really appreciate that we already have some people that have really stepped up big time and donated things. Um, but it, it did seem like we were using all but almost eight thousand dollars of this fund, and I know we can't just you know move money from different columns, but in in the environmental community focus area, we have um, sustainability and stewardship as our drivers, and we have five thousand dollars there in tree enhancements. And I don't know if that money could be used toward this or not. Thank you. Would you like an answer to that question? Well, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe that's not, it can't even come up in part of this discussion, but there is. So the tree enhancement program is, is the fund that we use to uh, use for trees that may be diseased that are inside of a public right-of-way. And so that we'll use that as kind of like a replacement tree and, and, and those types of things. So it has a okay. has a dedicated purpose, and, purpose. And, and has been set aside for when we have to replace trees that we take out in the right of way, we use that fund for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, we had a few folks from the public who wanted to address. So Paul Smith, please come forward, sir. Smith. I used to own property in the city. I live in the county. <laughs> um, we are, our heritage is the most 
successful private irrigation project in the United States. That's where we are. Uh, now, there are Bureau of Reclamation projects that turned out to be successful, but we are the best as a private irrigation uh, project. Uh, I really like the idea of celebrating that and educating with it. Uh, let me try to tell you, maybe help you with your decision. First, I think we were told that we were to find a project under $30,000. Uh, and uh, that's pretty tough. Uh, for instance, next Monday, we're pouring a statue in Joseph, Oregon, of our original surveyor. The full-size statue at one and a quarter times the actual size will cost us $140,000, counting the base. So uh, this is an all-privately funded art project, if it happens. Right now, all you'll see is a maquette uh, after next week. The, um, uh, by the way, he's surveying Shoshone and Maine with sagebrush and everything. Um, it's tough. Where would you put it if you didn't put it here? I think that's one thing. Number two, we thought that we had $30,000 to spend on the actual project. We did not know about Wendy's parks project. I thought that basically the parks department had excess money in their budget and was going to do it. I think our part of it, the art part of it, and the, and, and the canal company is firm absolutely firm that we can do that for $30,000. I don't think that we heard real firm figures at all tonight uh, about the park. And I think that we heard from Brian from the canal company that they're willing to kick in some, some real things, some work and everything. And by the way, they've always, I've been involved with other projects with them and they've always come through perfectly. When the canal board decides to do something, they will in the next three years, they'll be at it till it's done. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, the, the art project is hard to come by. Uh, it's hard to come by because, like, for instance, this statue we're talking about, the highway department doesn't want it there where we wanted it, and we have to move it. Uh, this, yes, there is problems that we don't have a huge parking lot attached to this thing, but uh, we also have visibility beyond comprehension for the whole city. Uh, we compromised, we thought, we, we agonized. The horse alone is probably costing $30,000. It's just that there's no other place to put it. Uh, this is a bargain as far as the art part is. I don't know if those ramblings will help you a little bit, but uh, I wish we had had absolute firm numbers tonight and knew where we were going to go. And then there are private foundations in the community. If you need money, we'll try to find it for you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yes? I'm sorry. So on these numbers, I, I didn't include anything that would, the cement for the head gate, all of the work that the canal company had volunteered to do. So these numbers include um, the concrete curbing, pouring a concrete foundation for the horse, um, plants, replacing the sprinkler system, putting a retaining wall on the back side of the uh, rock um, canal mm -hmm. part, and um, about 3,200 for lights. So that's where some of these numbers are coming from. I, I believe that there's probably some wiggle room on actual plant purchases and some labor that maybe we can do that would be but when it comes to some of the hard costs as far as the landscaping, or the um, weed fabric and those kinds of things, th those numbers are probably pretty solid. And the guys did take a look at them and were all comfortable with that number. So I, I think it's, there's probably a little bit of wiggle room on it, but it's not as random as maybe it's sounding like. Right. Thank you, Wendy. Mr. Newland. Max Newland, I'm a resident of your fine city of Twin Falls. Thank you, sir. I'm a concerned citizen, and I read your minutes before I come to this meeting, or the public, and I said, oh, here's something about art. I should show up and say what I think. And I've always encouraged the council to be innovative and do something new, and, oh, we better not try that. We've got to see how someone hasn't done it. We better be careful. And I talked to uh, <laughs> Alice, and he says, 
he watches every penny. So I says, can you make $22,000 a year? He says, I worry about every penny. I'm pleased that he does. I'm going to vote for him again if I get the chance. I I will put down twenty dollars as a citizen. One ten one thousandth of the money you guys need to make this happen. I'm pleased with the place. I'm sure there might be some other place that have parking and bathroom and blah 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 blah. But my my family asked me why is it called Magic Valley? And I says because the water came in and turned it. And I says, how big is it? And I says, as far as the High Line Canal goes. That's all Magic Valley. And we kind of cheat a little bit on what we call Magic Valley. And where does Treasure Valley stop and Magic Valley start and you know all those other names we give ourselves. But this is a good thing, and, and Mr. Newland's in favor of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Susie Capillaris. Another one I forgot to give credit to. Welcome, Susie. Thank you. My name is Susie Capillaris. I uh, live uh, at 1231 Sunburst here in town with my husband, John, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Um, I had the privilege and the opportunity of acting as a concerned and interested citizen on this committee. I'm a teacher by trade and a scholar of public art, specifically. That was my master's thesis. So it's very interesting to me. And I felt that. Um, the value of this public art, as the mayor said, can't be understated in the role that it plays for the community. Um, as a witness of the, the prosperity and the incredible things going on here, we have incredible progress here. I think art in Twin Falls and the arts community is thriving. Um, it's a fantastic thing. I grew up here. I said I would never, ever come back. <laughs> and and here, here I am, right? Don't ever say never. And so here I am. But I was so happy to come back and see the wonderful things that the city and the, the college and all the different aspects of town that have grown and developed. Um, <coughs> the incredible nature of our community with its low housing costs, its low unemployment, a low crime rate, the friendly faces. It's... Um, Unbeatable, and I feel that an art piece of this nature would exhibit that. It would be a sign to um, our entire community, to our state, to the nation of who we are, what we have done, where we've come from, where we're going, um, and that uh, it would welcome. Originally, we debated uh, about the location, so I'm I'm with the mayor at the agree a public art strategy would be a wise idea, and you could always ask me to help with that. Um, but that uh, I do think this is a good location. We agonized over location and all the different pros and cons, and it would be a really kind of welcome to Twin Falls, welcome to historic downtown was kind of how we envisioned the purpose of it. Um, I think it projects the image of progress and prosperity well, while also educating and showcasing our history and the wonderful things that make the Magic Valley magic. And it would do that in a way that we could all be proud of. So I would strongly urge you all to consider voting in favor of this public art piece. And thank you for dealing with my shaky voice. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you so much. Mayor Susan Capillaris was a diligent uh, volunteer for our group as well. So that's all the folks I had signed up to speak about it. So I suppose we can. Oh, yes, please come forward. Hi, I'm Glenita Ziderville. You guys will get used to my name. I'm from Jerome, so this doesn't really, I know my vote doesn't count being in Jerome County, but I frequent Twin Falls a lot and Blue Lakes a lot. And my concern with this is. Blue Lakes and Five Points is <coughs> such a bad traffic area. And that added distraction with all the other distractions that drivers are dealing with. You know, if we did, you know, made it where they had the, um, where children can come and see it and learn the history of it, they're going to have to be watching them so closely that a kid doesn't run out in the road just in a spur of a moment. 
and uh, maybe a driver hit them, or we have distractions with the traffic because they're looking there. You know, is that something that you guys also um, looked into as far as the traffic part of it and, and it being maybe a distraction and causing more accidents and more, more chaos on Blue Lakes and Five Points? So I just didn't, you know, I'm kind of coming into this just today, but just listening to it, I just think that something, you know, as an outsider driving Blue Lakes often, that that could cause, I mean, I would just be mortified if they were having a field day there and a kid ran out and somebody ran them over, that would be mortifying. And so that's just something that I think we need to, as an outsider, you know, consider. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to uh, give us any input on this? All right. <coughs> Don Hall. I'd like to make a motion if we're ready. Sure. I would like to um, approve the request to approve the concept and funds for the public art piece to be installed at North Five Pocket Park, Five Points Pocket Park. You're right, it's hard to say. Uh, the project will be 25000 for the sculpture of the horse and uh, additionally another 22000 for the landscaping, lighting, curbing, rock and other amenities. Uh, associated with that side note about that we don't have to spend all the other 22,000 if it doesn't need to be done second that motion by Don Hall seconded by Chris Talkington to fund the to approve the concept and funds for the project as presented Nicky Boyd um, we have, can have discussion mm -hmm. um, I would like to put a cap on I would like that in the motion that um, I don't know if we want to just not round to exceed. not to exceed uh, twenty thousand, or I I don't know if that's shooting ourselves in the foot with the extra two thousand. But so I, you I could certainly amendment. make an amendment to the yeah. motion, to or, or, or I could change the motion. What are you shooting for? I I have a really hard time going over twenty. I, I'd like it to be done for ten, because then there's enough left in there to do something again relatively soon rather than waiting all these years like we just did. But I don't know if it can be done for 10, so I definitely want to have a cap on that that it can't go over that. Over no. 10 or 20? 20. 20. Uh, I would um, amend my motion to uh, the cap for the landscaping being no more than 20, if the second would agree with that. Absolutely. Okay. Nikki, did you have anything else to add on that? I don't. Suzanne Hawkins. I don't know who this question's for exactly. Um, so I'm wondering, is it does this decision have to be made tonight, or can we wait until we get firm numbers on what the installation's going to cost? Because I'm very in favor of the artwork, but I'm not in favor on approving something until we know exactly what we're looking at. I feel like we're um, making a decision without all the facts, and for me, that that it just leaves me with an uncomfortable feeling. So is there a rush on this decision, or can we wait and get a better estimate on the costs? Anyone from the committee have an answer for that, possibly, or not? It would help me immensely to know if we're proceeding with this exact, or if we're talking about expanding it, because that's going to help me a lot in getting more solid numbers. Um, I think we need a price on what this is. And that's what I tried to do for you. So then, you, so you, I guess I'm just not, the 22,000 seems like it's possibly. 20. Well, I know we just made a motion to change it to 20, but in our report it, it asked for 22. And I'm just, you know, I, I would, feel more comfortable having a, it's going to cost this amount for rocks, it's going to cost this amount. And that's what, yeah. And, that's and we don't have that information tonight. Right. the rocks and yeah. things, because I didn't know for sure what kind of rock we wanted to look into, um, so we just kind of ballparked the landscape so, rock. So you did an estimate, you didn't do a bit. Right, absolutely, yeah. and that's all it is. I get but, that. Um, but if, if this is what we're looking at, I can probably get you a more solid number with that. If we want to talk about expanding it, I would need to kind of know what that concept would look like too. I would just feel better voting on a more exact bid price than an estimate personally. 
Travis, did you have a comment on that? So I think that what Wendy's done is she's gone through and she has uh, identified the items and then she's gone forward and, and really put her best knowledge to that. And until you get down to the unit quantity cost and then you also have to know the total number of units, getting that really hard bid is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, we at the staff level will do everything that we can to, to make sure that we're, we're cost conscious just as we always have been on every single one of these projects. And I, and I, and I really appreciate you know, the need to have more information and, and more concrete information. But what you see is the exact same thing that Wendy's using to create bid specs or, and to get those estimates. And as you can see, there is some room to interpretation. And, and what we typically do in that is we're going to be more conservative in our approach, recognizing that our, our goal is always to work downward from the number that's allocated to, by the council, never to go up. I mean, I would hate for us to come in and commit that we could do this for $5,000 and then come back to you and say, I'm sorry, we were wrong. This is really going to be closer to $20,000. I have a comment, Chris. Donald. I would just say I'm comfortable with the uh, motion because it's not to exceed. Um, it gives us some time to work through this, this process. Um, and my hope, honestly, is working with uh, Lamar and others that we can actually save a lot of money and, and expand it at the same time. Because, again, one of my goals here is to long-term maintenance. If we can cut down on some of the lawn there, less watering, less mowing, all those other dynamic dynamics, I think that's the way to go. That's why I think that the not to exceed uh, works for me, and I can be in some support of the motion. Ruth Pierce. So my question kind of relates to something Paul said. A not to exceed would allow us to pursue a grant or a, a contribution by some of the foundations that are around here that have mm -hmm. okay yes thank you so I'm just going to emphasize again I have nothing against this piece of art I have nothing against historic activities um, I think that spending forty five thousand dollars with the absence of a strategy is a foolish way to spend money even if it does fit the eventual strategy. I just don't feel comfortable doing it and I would rather we take a pause and talk about what we want public art to do. So I will not be voting in support of the funding for this tonight. So with that, I see no more input. So Sharon, roll call vote, please. <coughs> Greg Lanting? Yes. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Berriger? No. Chris Talkington? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So, so now the with, work starts. So with that, I would like to say, in spite of the fact that we'll be spending a good chunk of the fund on a project, I think that we do need to have a conversation about a strategy for public art to reinforce uh, efforts and activities throughout the city so that we don't um, end up with a haphazard uh, system of public, private, and whatever installments of things that some people think are art and some things that aren't. So I would ask that as we do our strategic plan update this coming year or even as a separate activity to talk about how do we have a strategy for it to do things because in my conversations with Mandy, I actually do think it would be very beneficial for us in finding other funding sources if we had a strategy for what we were trying to do with the art. So there's my two cents and I'm off my soapbox now. Don Hall. I would just say I, I absolutely 100% agree with you. We need a strategy and a planning um, for how we're going to spend these dollars in the future. I think it's wise and prudent for us to do so, so I agree with you. The other thing that I will say, one of the reasons that I was um, interested in and not to exceed is, and what our city manager said, is I have every intention of pushing in our next year's budget 
a backfill because we don't want to leave this fund depleted uh, for future uh, opportunities that will come our way, especially once we have a strategic plan yep. regarding. Exactly. Thank you. Um, Travis, how long is your presentation? Four hours. <laughs> so I can understand I can be long winded. So longer than 10 minutes. And so if you want to take a break, okay. I'm certainly. So, yeah, let's. We're going to take about a not quite a 10 minute recess. The agenda is the request to adopt the tentative fiscal year 2017 budget for the city of Twin Falls and set August 29th, 2016 at 6 p.m. as the date and time for the pu budget public hearing. City Manager Travis Rothweiler. Welcome, Travis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So tonight, I believe, is our ninth installment of this conversation moving forward with the budget. And, and as we've had those conversations over the course of the last several weeks, we've gone forward and we've highlighted how this, strate how this budget connects directly to our strategic plan, the strategic plan that was helped and created by our citizens, and a strategic plan that really has the, the eight <coughs> different focus areas. Earlier this year, as you know, I came to you and we had a conversation about the different parts of the strategic plan and how all of the seven external elements had a common link, and that was that internal piece. The talented men and women that work for the city of Twin Falls who deliver public services day in and day out to all of our citizens, to our businesses, and our visitors alike. And, and really to be able to accomplish all of those strategic planning objectives, we spend time talking about the value of our organization. And this year we've made an intentional effort to really invest in our organization and continue to move forward. Because by investment in our organization means that we're going to continue to have long-term investment in our community. Ultimately, realizing us to complete the vision that's been set forward. And then this will be the last year that we look at this version of the strategic plan. As we move forward, the strategic plan is through 2030, but shortly after we adopt that budget, this upcoming budget, then we will go into the process of revising and updating the 2030 strategic plan. It will be a robust community involvement piece. And really, once we complete the comprehensive plan that will help feed into the strategic plan, we'll be able to then move this forward to our long-term planning committee. And that means in six months from now, we will come back Set to you. This whole process again. <laughs> we will come back to you, and we will begin the conversation of the upcoming budget. And I, and I share that because budgeting for us as a complex organization is not something that we do just for a couple of weeks in the summer. Our budgeting process is a thoughtful, meaningful approach that's connected to our strategic plan that goes for uh, really the duration of the year. We started this a couple of years ago and what we like to do is tell you the conclusion first. And here is the conclusion of this year's budget, the potential impacts of where we stand today. Um, tonight we're going to ask you to adopt a maximum spending number. And that doesn't mean that you're setting the budget. What you're doing is you're setting the spending ceiling. And you will, over the course of the next two weeks, continue to be able to vet this budget, to continue to welcome, welcome public input, to public comment, and to make adjustments and changes. But the thing that you can't do is you can't cross over that ceiling that you'll approve tonight. And so what we will do tonight is maybe hopefully get to a place that allows us to create a budget that is in final form for between now and the 29th, because what we want to do on the 29th when we have a public hearing is to present a final budget to the citizens. And so when they're having in the opportunity to comment on, that they are there. So here you'll notice that the tax rate is still variable between $8.03 and $8.16, and, $8 and that variability is really connected to that $300,000 or nearly $300,000 that we've been talking about that has not been fully allocated. Um, you'll notice that there is the difference in the tax rate, and one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking about and will continue to show is the tax rate is not an indication of individual tax loads. The tax rate is, is simply a multiplier that is taken against the individual properties. One of the things that we did at the suggestion of uh, Councilman Lanting is we broke this down 
into a uh, both annual and month-to-month -month, uh, difference. And so you can kind of see what that looks like um, as we kind of move forward. So you can see what the recommended budget is at the bottom from a monthly cost compared to a monthly cost from the prior year. And that includes um, the property tax portion divided into 12 equal installments. And then it takes a look at the individual utility bill uh, that would be the monthly installment to come up with the total monthly cost and then we compare that to the variance for what this recommended budget is and you can see that this budget based upon that median home is about two dollars and thirty one cents to three dollars and ten cents per month um, for an owner occupied median home and again that's not the case for all cases in fact we can illustrate that there are actually some and several properties inside the city of Twin Falls who will pay less in property tax and because of the amount that they're paying less in property tax it will actually cost them less to live in Twin Falls in this upcoming year under this budget than the current year that they're under right now. As you know we waited for some time um, to receive the uh, the information from uh, the county in terms of our total taxable value. Um, earlier, uh, I guess last week, the county sent out a notice to some of the taxing districts that their number was going through a slight change. We were not part of that, so our number is still remained. The total taxable value of the city of Twin Falls, which is a measure of health, is $2,325,231,000. That's up about $15.5 million from the prior year. But what's important to note and what's maybe of interest is the new construction value, the new properties that came onto the rolls equaled $67 million. And so this reflects that all of the existing properties from the prior year decreased by about $16.6 .6 million. Greg Lanting. Travis and we've talked about this several times and I went out and did a little anecdotal uh, fact gathering on my own and uh, and then a Times News article was kind of along the same bounds. I was like it appears that if you talk to developers and you talk to real estate people and things like that where the assessor is not keeping up is on the lot values. He is still using lot values that are two and three years old and lot values are changing monthly upward and so he, that's where they think that it's probably where it possibly is coming from but yeah but but not everybody is agreement on that either so there's a little like I said it was anecdotal I talked to developers I talked to a few real estate people in, in there I think there are many different variables that that are taken into account number one an increase in a homeowner's exemption is going to be a part of that depreciation of personal property would be a part of that if you're part of a part of a business that is not protected by the hundred thousand dollar exemption and cap and so there are so many variables that go into that number but what I think is important to recognize is that if the city of Twin Falls local economy was not as robust and we were not witnessing the type of new construction and growth the total taxable value of the city would have decreased uh, had we not crested more than what um, you know, that, that uh, 67 million dollars Nikki, Nikki Boyd has a comment, Travis. I happened to talk to an assessor, and I asked him, because, I mean, just look at home prices, what they've done since February, between February and May, and he said, oh, they they used January of whatever year the assessment right. is. So everything they're doing, they're basing He's on what it was worth prior months. in January. January. Yep. So right. that might make a little difference. Yeah. So we've spent a little bit of time talking about the um, $300,000 and how that came to be. And part of that was early when we start our processes. In fact, we start our processes a lot earlier than we get hard information. Um, so we use the best information that we have to make some conservative estimates. And by moving forward, we had an early estimate of new construction value of about $40 million. The initial came in at $68.5 million. That was further refined to the number that you see there of $67.1 million. That generated additional uh, property tax numbers should the council elect to take this, what we refer to as the statutory increase, which is the 3% plus the value of new construction 
and growth. And so if you do that, that gives you an additional amount of monies that would be eligible for um, review and, and for conversation. And so the net difference of that was about uh, $213,000 associated with that. And then we had also shared that we had about $60,000 of, of funds that as we were waiting for this number to come in that we did not allocate. So tonight um, you would have about $275,000 of monies. We've been referring to a 300, but about $275,000 of monies that if you elected to move forward, you could allocate uh, into this budget. So this is just a, a graphical reflection of the different tax rates. Again, we want to illustrate that the tax rate is simply a multiplier and it does not indicate the individual tax loads. And, and so this is how this tax rate is impacted by looking at $100,000 increments. And so for every $100,000 that you want to utilize, um, you can see that you know um, the full 300000 would result in a property tax uh, assessment or tax rate of $8.16. If you elected to use none of that, the tax rate would decrease to 803 We talk about the homeowner's exemption, and this is key in the conversation because this is part of that mathematical formula that is going to impact the individual uh, tax load of each of those individual properties. Uh, the homeowner's exemption, which was previously indexed, in fact, this is the last year that it is indexed. Next year, it will be a flat $100,000 or 50%, whichever is less. This is... Um, 94,000 or 50 percent, whichever is less, and you can see that it was up from $89,500. That's about a 5.7 percent increase in the homeowner's exemption, and so again, when we start looking at why did this whole taxable value fall, part of that may be because of the more people are enjoying a larger exemption than what they had in the prior year. So if we take a look at an average home, we take a look at um, in the current fiscal year, they pay property taxes equal to $5.66. And then if you kind of move this all the way through, you can see the different tax rates that they would pay based upon the different um, tax rate that is assessed based upon our spending. One of the things that is important to note is that um, if you are below the $89,000, in taxable value because of where the last year's homeowner exemption, like you can't qualify for anything more, then you don't benefit in, from the growth of the community. Um, and that's really how the Idaho tax system is, is set up. And so you get 50% or whichever is less. And so a house that has $144,000 of value this year and had $144,000 of value last year their total taxable value remains unchanged, and so fluctuations in that tax rate do have an impact on those houses. They also have an impact, but on, a, on the other way, on a $200,000 house. And so if you take a $200,000 house, which is eligible for the maximum exemption last year, and they would also be eligible for the maximum exemption this year, you can see that in every scenario, they are paying less in property taxes this year than they did the prior year. And, and that is just, that is a function of the Idaho property tax system where at the local government level, we set the spending and the, the county assessor provides us with the total taxable value. And that is a mathematical formula and the state of Idaho says that all properties within the state, within a particular geographic and taxing entity shall be assessed the exact same tax rate. There's nothing you can do about this. The only thing that you can affect and change is to change the amount of money that you choose to spend. Um, so that's the tax supported funds in their total. And then moving into the water fund, these are the areas that we control 100% of those processes. Um, you'll notice that we spent a lot of time talking about water, the importance of water, and the water capital projects that we have moving forward. Uh, we're asking for a 5% rate adjustment um, in the water fund. The average water user uses about 18,000 gallons of water, and so their increase is about 19 cents per month or $2.28 uh, per year. 
Um, and that is for someone who uses 18,000 gallons of water. If you obviously use more water, you would pay more. And what's important is we talk about the average resident, but know the resident is the base number, and this applies uniformly to all of our water users, the commercial users, the industrial users, uh, all of those users alike. The sewer fund, we're asking for a 5% increase, and one of the things we spend time talking about is that really is to honor the, the bond covenants that we set forward to ensure that our revenues are equal to um, 20, uh, 1 to 125 ratio, an additional 25%. And that's, that's just to ensure that the bondholders, uh, to the bondholders that we have the ability and the capacities to make, to make those payments. When we look at that, it really is the operational side. And so the, when we look at the 1 to 125 ratios, we already removed the capital. So that is not part of that equation. This really is the human component that it takes to work through our lift stations and our collection lines, as well as our management agreement that we have with uh, CH2M. Um, the the 8,000 gallon is what we've often called a typical user. Um, this is an increase of about $1.24 per month or $14.88 per year. We talked a little bit about raising that cap, and our recommendation right now is to kind of move forward with this plan and give us time to take a look at that cap um, over the course of the next fiscal year and maybe look some different, some different strategies. By taking an 8,000 gallon cap, one of the things that we've noticed is that based upon research that we've done, it is artificially low. In fact, there are about 30%, I believe, Lori, 30% of our customers that exceed that 8,000 cap on a routine basis. And so because we cap that, unlike the water fund, if you use it, you get billed for it because it ran through your meter. Um, because a lot of places in our community use water for uh, non-consumptive uses that don't make its way into a, a wastewater treatment facility, um, we give a cap or a credit to say that you know they didn't exceed 8,000 gallons. And what we're able to do is know um, there's probably a little bit more, and so we're going to be spending some time prior to the uh, next budget looking at that cap and, and, and presenting some different sewer billing options to the council to consider that might be um, a little bit more representative of the consumption that is used uh, by citizens to our sewer facilities. Don Hall. Travis, give us an example of what you're talking about. There's those that are, is it a swimming pool kind of a situation, those kind of things? So it, not necessarily. So let's say that the Rothweiler household and we're terribly inefficient and we do lots of washing of whatever and we let the water just run, which probably is true with the seven and eight year old or seven and nine year old, right? Um, we get billed for 8,000 gallons, period. That's the cutoff. And let's say in the winter months, you see that I'm using 12,000 gallons of water in December, okay? You know that there is no other place that I could have sent those 12,000 gallons other than into the wastewater treatment facility because it's not going to irrigate our lawns. It's not going to any sort of practice that wouldn't cause it to go into our wastewater treatment plant. So in that case, that fictional case where my sewer bill or my water bill would be 12,000 gallons, there's 4,000 gallons that I am contributing to the sewer plant that I am not being billed for. And, and when you look at trying to have individuals pay their proportionate share of the cost, for someone who is using 8,000 gallons or less, they are going to be high, paying a higher proportionate share of their costs than what they otherwise would because I'm not paying my fair share. I'm getting 4,000 gallons for free. And, and what we want to do is spend some time really analyzing that to make sure that each one of our citizens is paying their proportionate cost. But most importantly, and part of the reason we want to do that is we have bond covenants that state that each of our individual users will be paying their fair share. And so we want to spend some time looking at that. We do not have time between now and the adoption of the budget to do that. And so we're asking the council to approve this with the intent of coming back and presenting a, a better formula to you. So you'll be coming back with some research to tell us what you found out. We will. And then uh, we're hoping that a new philosophy will be incorporated 
uh, for the fiscal year I get 18 budget at that point in time and then we would go through an educational process and then roll forward with a with a new new uh, strategy thank you in the last of the three major funds is going to be the sanitation fund this recommends um, a 2.32 percent increase we've talked about some of those increases a part of it is associated with the PSI contract the other part of that is associated with the increase in the uh, the potential increase in the tipping fees that we're going to be seeing by uh, the Southern Idaho Solid Waste. We had a wonderful conversation with uh, Josh Bartlemy, and I think that he did a really good job explaining to staff in terms of what that looks like and, and needs and moving forward. And so this budget it recommends incorporation of those fees that would be passed on. The total cost to our residents is about uh, 38 cents per month, and we're talking about this. Um, recognizing that this is going to be that maximum user there's going to be other users that are going to be coming into the system as a result of the new P PSI contract and the different size of cans that we're talking about moving forward but this is going to be that uh, 90 gallon customer 95 gallon customer ratio so this is kind of where the conversation begins next is that's that is where we left the conversation and the council said well if we were to consider some all or no portion of those two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars what would staff recommend moving forward and and we put together these items and really there's um, There's some really good information behind some of this. The items in yellow are the items that were recommended by the long-term planning committee, but did not make its way um, into the budget that you see before you. Um, so when you look at the victim witness coordinator, that is a that I believe is a key position. And like I said, if I had a chance to have a do-over based upon what I knew the new construction numbers would have been, that would have been certainly and the only position that I that I would have included. Um, you'll notice that um, we've had conversations and we're still looking and, and, and vetting our relationship with the Y, and we've had conversations about what does our relationship look like moving forward. And while we've drawn no conclusions and we are still in our phase of due diligence, we do recognize that if the city of Twin Falls were to take over operations of the pool, it is going to cost us um, more than the amount that we contribute right now and our best guess would be an additional hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year so it'd be a total price tag of about three hundred thousand dollars to to operate the pool in a in a first year um, there's a possible we we shared with the city council that this year we're moving forward and we're having BDPA review all of the positions in our salary and unfortunately we're not going to have the information available here what this would do is reserve say an additional hundred and fifty thousand dollars to do a mid-year adjustment of BDPA's work on that salary table it would just accelerate where we would want to go as opposed to um, waiting till the upcoming fiscal year um, I did remove a I went through the different budgets and I removed about $75,000 from the different travel and training budgets across the different uh, parts of our organization. Um, I put that back in as a conversation piece because uh, increasing the knowledge, skills, and abilities of our employees is one of our strategic planning objectives. And, and uh, the seventy-five thousand dollars wasn't necessarily vetted by long-term planning. It was uh, it was a number that was placed in by the individual departments, and so that represents, uh, you know, a sprinkling from all of the departments that we made compensation a priority. And so, in order to fund our five and five plan, um, there was some give and take on on the uh, travel and training. Don Don Hall has a comment. Travis. Talk to me about BDPA. Uh, how long have we been using them? Um, you have full confidence in their abilities. I, I just remember in the old days, there was a lot of controversy with the accuracy, the um, and, and so I'm not, I'm not questioning you, no, the integrity of it. I just want to make sure 
that you're you have full confidence in this group you know I do um, I have found them to be probably the foremost expert when it comes to uh, compensation compensation strategies because of how many different organizations they touch um, BDPA only recommend strategies to us <coughs> the other side of the coin is to make sure that we're implementing the strategies as they have laid out and part of our problem as an organization is maybe we have not always implemented the strategies as as maybe it was executed and and there are are things that maybe organizationally when you reflect back and say wow it seemed like a really good idea at the time i think that each one of those can maybe be dissected but i don't know if i can assign necessarily fault with bdpa in submitting the information it's maybe what we did with that information and right now we're working with bdpa to take a look at our entire salary table to say does it still make sense is this position still connected to this position on the salary table? Um, we have some compression issues. And some of the areas that we're looking at in compression, does the model still make sense? Are there tweaks and changes that we need to make to the model? And uh, we've had some interesting conversations even today. If you ask Sue Harris, she will tell you that it almost is if the, the compensation theories of the city of Twin Falls kind of evolve around a circle that you know, eventually she has seen those iterations kind of move forward, and we were chucking, chuckling earlier today because we even talked about step and grade system and, and how a step and grade system was once used. We gave up a step and grade system uh, to go to a pay for performance system, and then we gave up the pay for performance system to look at a true, uh, you know, more of a merit based performance system. And so now, uh, is a step and grade system really the piece that kind of helps deal with compression because it has a better ability of recognizing tenure so it's 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 really across the board this right here implements the 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 conversation that BDPA is currently working on I have no idea if one hundred and fifty thousand dollars is a right number I just looked at the amount of money that we used to move the last table um, mid-year adjustment that we did in June and said that that would be a really good healthy start how long have we been using them again? Because I know we used them before. Did we drift away from them, and now we're back to them again? I think that we've always used BDP. We've all it, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of a time in which we didn't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we've only been with BDP. <coughs> and they do the Northwest Data Exchange piece, which is really – uh, really good information um, kind of moving forward um, restrooms and band shell improvements at City Park that was something that was really put forward and, and you know when you have the longest running municipal band um, and City Park is really an, an asset to the community and if you think about how much it is used this is one of those projects that you really that I really didn't want to remove, but when you started looking at the fundability in comparison to the other priorities, unfortunately this one was was was, was uh, removed from the list. Um, another piece was seventy-two thousand dollars for uh, additional for the curbs and gutters around Baxter Park on Blake Street. You'll notice that we have $150,000 for a reader board, and, and the reader board that is being contemplated is not a monument sign, but as we've had conversations, because we're trying to find the right place for a monument, um, it's really difficult. And so what we've looked at is there are actually some pretty interesting archways that maybe you could place over Shoshone that could say, welcome to historic downtown and have a reader board. Maybe that's at the corner of, of Shoshone um, and Fourth or somewhere in there. So you got City Park. Um, we think that we could partner with the county on more of the uh, detention center side of the county property. We're not in front of the historic courthouse, but maybe a little bit more to the general north of that where you could have kind of an archway and, and a reader board. That reader board would allow us to program that all of the time, and it would not 
it would allow us to convey messages. It would allow us to do some different things. If you take a look at all the different new reader boards out there, I think that you could do some pretty uh, in inventive things. Um, and you could probably put that art up there really quickly and do it remotely as opposed to some of the concerns. And so we're still able to hit the information while we're also not um, maybe endangering some of our, our, our folks and, and certainly um, maybe not violating our own sign code. Um, the payroll electronic time card management system was something that was proposed by uh, the finance department and really there's lots of organizations that are going to this where you have an electronic time card. It really kind of helps eliminate all of the different keystrokes and issues that our payroll team has to move forward with. But it also gives our employees instant access to be able to change their their their, uh, their uh, deductions and their withholdings if they need to get uh, proof of you know, W-2s, they can, they can pull that off. And so everything, it, it's an employee portal that allows them to have constant access. This was supported. Uh, it did fit within our strategic plan. Again, this was something that the finance department uh, had <coughs> elected to remove, to, to kind of move some of these things forward. And then reengineering of the city's website is about $140,000. Um, that creates a much more robust platform. One of the things that we found with our website currently is that there's a lot of information, and sometimes it's very difficult to navigate by some people. Um, and they've, our website, you know, is kind of starting to show its age a little bit. And, and, and this would allow us to go through a significant revision of that website. Um, it would also allow us to do a lot more things from whether it be an Android or an iPhone or some sort of mobile device, one of the things that we found is that when we send out job announcements, we have lots of individuals who are interested and they start doing a couple of clicks with a mobile device. And then our, our as I understand it in talking with Josh, our website isn't necessarily mobile compliant, if you will. Yes. And so it, it we actually drop people off. Um, because the technology has actually evolved beyond the capacities of our website. And if in, in, in my tenure with the city of Twin Falls, this is our third website. So it, it's, I mean, just to put that in perspective, it's not like we haven't been making advances and changes. It's just that the technology and the devices we're using are moving faster than what we've been, what we've been keeping up with. And so $140,000 is a complete retool and recategorization of, of the entire website um, moving forward. And then obviously tonight we had the conversation about public art and, and some portion um, of, of what to do. Um, so right here is obviously a lot more. Um, but this was the list. And so I asked um, members of the city's executive team to feed me information that they would like to have placed back in here. Um, I will say that if you if you choose to fund more than the $300,000, um, we need to know that because the Idaho Code calls us and has, says that if you intend to use any portion of the foregone balance, we have to hold a special public hearing. And so that would be a separate motion that you would need to make later tonight. We can walk you through that if you choose to use any of that 300. Right now, the budget that we've set forward um, keeps the entire foregone balance intact, and it is not used or considered. Chris Dockins. <clears throat> so is this pretty well a wrap? That is all. Yep. That's is it, what we have now. I'm not teasing. I just want to go back to the non-enterprise funds for a moment. If I understand now, <clears throat> our 3%, I, I want to talk in relation to property tax <clears throat> payers. The 53.4% 50, of our overall budget is property tax supported roughly. Of our general we, fund. So of we, the general fund, yes. So of that, uh, we're proposing the 3% will generate just over 546000 Yes. And then there's another 300,000 available that we just talked about, or is that included in that 546? That, that's above. So you're, that's above. Let me get to the right page. My question is whether it's 546 or 846, what, what does this represent to 
property tax escalation in general, not the individual home. Yep. So if you take a look at page, I don't know if you have your budget in front of you, but for those that are looking, it would be on page 24. Um, now, if you're looking at an electronic version and you go to page 24, and I, it's page 24 of the city manager's narrative as, as published. Kind Where of is it in this? Yep, that's 24. right there, 24. page 24. We often joke that we know these pages pretty <laughs> intimately. Um, so if you look at the very last paragraph, you'll notice that um, if you take a look at the total increase in, um, in, in revenues, um, you'll notice that $539,699 uh, was a result of the $68.5 million. And so that's going to be slightly less um, in terms of new construction. But generally speaking, we anticipate total property collections for fiscal year 2017 to be $19,288,870, which is an increase of roughly $1,085,000 um, compared to last year's property tax collections of $17,898. So that is a representation of all of the property tax dollars that are collected. This calls for the statutory increase. Um, and that statutory increase is the 3%, as well as the new construction and annexation. I obviously didn't ask my question correctly, but thank you for uh, reacquainting me with that page. Okay. I can happy to try again. No, you, you tricked me enough on this. I had the wrong information. Okay. <laughs> you didn't trick me. I, I, I would take that word back. <laughs> you set me straight. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Travis? Sure, we go back to the public. Greg Lansing? I don't have a question, but a comment. Uh, I've been out here long enough to know that, like Travis said at the beginning of his statement turn that on so everybody can hear me um, that we're, we're setting a number tonight that is a, a maximum okay we cannot go over this number uh, we have two weeks to make up our mind whether we want to take that take that a full amount that maximum number or we want to go to a lower number but we can't do it the other way we can't decide on a lower number I'm getting a nod from Lori and that's a good thing Okay. We cannot decide to take the lower to number tonight and then change our mind two weeks from now and say, oh, well, well, we really would like to have the victim's coordinator, or we would really like to have. We can't do that. And so I am going to suggest that we take the maximum number. That doesn't mean that we approve the maximum number as our maximum tonight. That doesn't mean that we won't choose to take a smaller number in the somewhere in the next two weeks, at least probably at the public hearing. Uh, to give ourselves flexibility, uh, there may be something else that comes in down the road in the next two weeks that we haven't even envisioned. I remember many years ago when we were, not many years ago, a few years ago when we were uh, attract, uh, making an effort to attract a major employer and we decided to take none of the three percent and we boxed ourselves in the corner we just about had trouble making it happen because we didn't and we that came up in that two weeks and so i'm that will be my suggestion we take the the full three percent plus new construction and then we make up our minds whether we're using all that or we're coming back off that three hundred thousand in the next two weeks but none of the foregone right i'm not proposing any of the foregone right. if somebody else wants to do that i might be willing to listen Chris Toggins. And I endorse that concept, Greg. I think the 
the 3% plus the 300,000 is appropriate now. I will not support any use of the uh, carry forward. In fact, I will not uh, support any new staff in this year. That victim witness coordinator, I think I need to have more explanation of how it interfaces with CASA uh, and the county operations, and we could study it over this next year, but I think we've added uh, quite a bit of extra personnel cost, and I, I think this is not the year to, at the last minute, come in and add another staff. So those will be my conditions. Don Hall. I, I am in support of taking the full 3% and new construction. I am not in support of touching that foregone. The reason that I am adamant about that is the, we've got some big ticket items coming our way, whether that's the Canyon Road or something else that we need to have, if you will, a savings account so we can uh, tackle that at some other time. I am, I'm going to uh, go a different direction than Chris, just philosophically. I am 100% behind the victim witness coordinator. I think that um, our citizens need that as a, um, I've had a family member be a victim in the last couple years, and uh, although the sheriff's department's victim coordinator did a, a great job, there still wasn't enough time uh, dedicated <coughs> to this situation. And recently we've had some other situations obviously happen that I think the victim coordinator could uh, have made a huge difference. And again, the whole idea of trying to navigate the criminal justice system, which is <coughs> essentially a hostile situation. It just is. It's, it's, it's a um, uh, very difficult to go through that system, whether you're a victim, a suspect, whoever. The only winners in that system are the attorneys. <laughs> They're the only winners. Um, the rest of the folks are not. And to have someone there to support them through that process is very important to me. So I will be an advocate for that victim witness coordinator. Suzanne Hawkins. Thank you. I agree with everything has been said as far as the 3% and the new growth and the annexation. Um, again, I do not want to touch the foregone balance at this time myself. But on your list here, as we're mulling this over, is it possible to like take the restroom and band shell improvements at City Park and break them up since that's such a large number in case maybe we can tackle one and not the other? Um, maybe just kind, kind of breaking down some of the things a little bit more so we're making the best decision we can with, with the money. And then again, maybe decide not to pursue any of those. Um, there's a number of things on the list that grab my attention, so I'd like, I'd like time to mull them over a little bit. Greg Lanting. Travis, do we, or Lori, whoever is providing us with that maximum number that we need to put into our motion. I have that. Do you have that number? If I can write it down here. It is sixty million nine hundred fifty-eight thousand three hundred sixty-six dollars. Greg Lanton. I would move that we set our maximum budget at sixty million nine hundred fifty-eight thousand three hundred sixty-six dollars, and set our public hearing for August 29, 2016 at 6 p.m. at this location. Second. Motion by Greg Lanning, seconded by Chris Talkington to set the uh, tentative fiscal year 2017 budget and also the public hearing date. Is there any discussion from council? Seeing none, Sharon, roll call vote, please. Don Hall? Yes. Ruth Pierce? Yes. Suzanne Hawkins? Yes. Nikki Boyd? Yes. Sean Barriker? Yes. Chris Talkington? Yes. Greg Lanting? Yes. Motion passes 7 to 0. Travis, thank you to you and your team for all of your work on the budget over the last low these many weeks. And we'll uh, have a few more. All nine meetings? Or was it 90? I'm not sure. <laughs> Only nine. Well, it's been 90 internal meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you kind of get a little separation anxiety when the budget's done. You kind of you look at Lori and say, well, what are we going to do now? All right. We, so. we don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, sorry, Travis. <laughs> Chris and Don, he's got a mark today. <laughs> All right. 
Next on the agenda, we have uh, another opportunity for public input. If there's anybody still here who wants to uh, weigh in on anything. Oh, Max, you already had your one time. <laughs> I'm just teasing. You can speak again. I would like a curb cut at the canyon trail where it comes on the Eastland and Pole Line. I had to stop and lift my bike up, and there's traffic coming around. Yeah. That there's no curb cut where that Eastland comes, makes a corner, and Pole Line comes there, and you've extended the good job on making the trail that good, but you got this step right there that needs to talk about. So pass that along to the, who's, the, who's the right person. Tra Travis is nodding his head, so uh, we're, we're aware of it. I could have talked Travis directly, but thank, okay, thank you. Thank you I've Matt. actually already talked to uh, Jackie about that, and there's some prohibitions on what we can do in that close proximity to the corner. Oh. It's under advisement, though. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, items from the city manager, Mr. Rothweiler. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Nathan Murray. Hey, come on up. So Nate is um, our new economic development director, and he has been on the job about just about 12 hours now. Day. He's had his, yeah. um, three of our three of those hours were here. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and so we had a really good economic development ready team meeting today. We started to introduce him to some of our partners, and we will continue to do that over the course of the next several weeks. Um, Nate's office is going to be located in our temporary building uh, upstairs. We're going to make sure that he is easily accessible. We would encourage you to come and stop and, and say hi. But again, this is uh, Nate Murray, and I'll have a say, have a say a few words. Welcome, Nate. <laughs> Thank you, uh, first of all. Um, it, was a, it was a fun process going through the hiring here. Uh, pretty unique to me. Uh, I've been in the same position for, well, uh, in the same community for the last 15 years. And uh, just sitting here tonight, I, I'm impressed by... Um, I guess sort of the respect that has taken place uh, in your discussions. Uh, you know, you've disagreed at times, but it seems like a, a really forward-thinking community that knows how to express their uh, opinions in a very professional way. So I look forward to working with you. You know, thank you for putting your trust in me. Um, we made an offer on a home, and my family's excited to, to move here and get started and get ready to school for school and, and move forward this part of our life. So thank you. Thank you, Nate. Suzanne Hawkins. Okay, I have to ask. Do you prefer Nate or Nathan? Yeah. I think my mother calls me Nathan. Okay. The world, she calls me Nathan. That, that was for Don's so benefit, that's all. Susie or Suzanne? Exactly. Yeah. It, it's an ongoing discussion yeah. we're having. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome again. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you're, you off, you're off the hook now. And we're almost done. You get to go home soon. <laughs> Travis, anything else from you? Uh, just one other quick item, or, or two quick items, both on the 18th. So obviously, the 18th is the first day of school inside of Twin Falls, and, <coughs> and we've sent out some PSAs encouraging uh, members of our motoring community and our commuters uh, to really be on the alert for young children who are going to be excited and maybe running to school and are more a um, paying attention to getting to school as opposed to maybe their surroundings. And so we really encourage members of our community to um, really be mindful, especially these first few weeks of school, as little kids do tend to dart out of nowhere. So uh, that would be the first. The second is also on the 18th we do have um, our quarterly employee breakfast at the Senior Citizen Center. We would encourage you to come. The cinnamon rolls are fabulous. Um, and uh, it's a, just a really low-key opportunity for us to engage with our employees and simply say thank you for the hard work that they do day in and day out. Um, I believe it's from about 6.30 to about 9 to make sure that we can cover all of the shifts. And so come for the full time, come for a little bit of the time, but you're certainly welcome, and we want to make sure that we extend that invitation. Thank you, Travis. Council, anything for the good of the order? 
Ruth Pierce. I did have a couple calls regarding the intersection at Hankins and Fall, Falls, thank you. Um, regarding the four-way stop, yeah, Addison and, okay, the four-way stop. Um, and the question was asked me if there had been any, it, I, I understand it's a stepping stone to eventually putting the stoplight in there, which is a couple years down the road, correct? So it's on the state funding cycle, and so their funding cycle is slightly different than ours. As we understand it, this year it's going to be the um, engineering and construction with going out to bid for fiscal year 2018 on the state calendar, which means July, any time after July of 2017 is when you can anticipate construction. In having conversations with Jackie, we firmly believe that you're probably looking at a calendar year 18 construction for that. And so the traffic, the four-way stop right now is, is a means to have some level of traffic control in an area that we know that meets the warrants as we now go through a process to construct uh, the traffic signal. So the question that was asked me is if there had been any kind of study on the impact of the four-way stop at this point in time and the traffic on Addison. We typically would go through a study period uh, to place stop signs or any type of impeding signs, but we'll, we'll confer, we'll connect with our engineering department to find out exactly what we did to determine the placement of the, of the stop signs as an interim measure. I know that we went through a complete warrant analysis for the traffic signal, and that's how uh, funding was approved for that. So we'll connect with our engineering department and let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we will adjourn. April 18th at the Somerset. That's a Thursday.